Jordan, those of you that celebrated Easter or Passover last week, Pesach, let me know. Um, we have a big group today, so I thought I would jump on here early, let everybody come in, see how you're doing, share, anybody do any virtual Easter egg hunts, or did the Easter bunny, were they considered essential, where you're located, was there a drive-by? I know we had the fire department in my town last week. They drove around the big um, mascot dog for a couple hours on Friday. It was really cute. Oh, thanks, Karen. Karen likes the pre-show. I'm never sure if anybody actually likes the pre-show. I thought for today, one of the things I thought we could share and crowdsource a little bit because um, I try and bring a topic or something to, to do in the pre-show. But because today's topic is leadership, uh, Joey Rusnak from Lifeguard Authority will be talking leadership. I also thought I would hear from you guys what your favorite leadership books are, your favorite leadership um, blogs, anything that has helped you become a better leader in aquatics. I thought we could put together a resource for the show notes. I'll update it later with all of your favorite um, all of your favorite resources. So Erin says her daughter was more interested in throwing the eggs than putting them in her basket. One Minute Manager, yes, I also love the One Minute Manager. That is a great one. So I'm gonna put in the show notes, um, I'm gonna put in the chat box the show notes for today, and I'm gonna run you through some of my favorite resources that I've put on the show notes. So let me put those in the chat box. So I've pinned the show notes for today. That is where, as always, with any of these webinars, you'll be able to access the recording of Joey's session end of day tomorrow, uh, Tuesday, April 14th, once I get it uploaded on YouTube. Please make sure you're letting your colleagues and coworkers know that all of the webinars are available on YouTube. I'm getting a lot of DMs from people who are upset that they've missed sessions and they're not realizing that all of the webinars are online literally all of them, including the chat box, the show notes. Um, we did have some tech issues with different webinars where I had to splice out uh, different, um, let's say I dropped off or there was echo, but everything is on YouTube, knock on wood. That's why I've paid the big bucks so that we have the webinar recording. We are not able to live stream on Facebook. That is too much for my bandwidth to handle, but I am able to grab a full recording of this session and it will exist on YouTube in perpetuity. So every speaker, every presenter, they've donated their time. This is obviously not something that I'm gonna monetize because they've donated their time for the benefit of everybody. So they will exist on YouTube in perpetuity. So please, please, please add them to your playlists for staff, for colleagues, for anybody that you think would benefit. So um, Karen mentioned the One Minute Manager. If you click on your link, you can go ahead and see the different books that I love in leadership. Joey, I see you're here. Did you want to do a test run of the presentation? Let me know. Or if you want to wait till closer, just let me know. So we're talking this morning, just while we're waiting for, Joey will be starting after the hour. We're talking leadership resources. So what are your favorite books, your favorite blogs, anything that's helped you become a better leader, whether that's in aquatics, whether that's if your job is now more dry as a teacher or a manager or administration staff, what books or blogs have helped you? Um, so Katie's saying she loves the videos on YouTube. Thank you. I'm also a huge fan of playlists on YouTube for my students. And I'm so glad you mentioned that because I have probably 15 or 20 playlists I need to hit publish on. So I'm just scrolling. Stephanie mentions she's currently reading Dare to Lead by Brene Brown. I haven't actually read that, but I have heard really, really great things. Oh, Joey's gonna do a test. Hello, Joey. We gotta can see cover, gotta cover up the COVID hair. <laughs> yeah, I feel you. I've started trimming little scragglies where I can. Erin says, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. I love that one. It's a classic. The thing I found when I read it was I felt like I already knew everything it said. Like it was a really good book, but I, I think it's it's so amazing that at one point people didn't believe any of those 
leadership principles, right? So Joey's just doing a test run to make sure. Joey, I do see PowerPoint. Chat box, can you let you can also see his PowerPoint? Perfect. Stephanie says she can see it. Mitchell in Calgary can see it. Yep, scrolling just fine. Forward and backwards. Okay, perfect. I, I will I will be back then in a few minutes. Sounds good. So uh, I don't know if you want your camera on, Joey, or not, but you do have your camera on. Perfect. Okay, so don't if you're just arriving, don't worry, you're not late. We were just doing a test run. I wanted to talk leadership books. So if you see the show notes in the chat box, I have put in some of my favorite leadership books. So I'm going to run through a few of those. I was finding that I'm not able to get all the links in the in the chat box as I talk. So I put all the books I'm gonna mention on the show notes. I'll just do a word grab so you can see without the hyperlinks. And I'll run through a few of them. I'm not going to run through all of them right now, but here's a few of them. Oh, sorry, that just condensed them all into one blurb. So a couple books that I love that have really helped me as a leader, both in aquatics and in different jobs that I've had. So uh, The Power of Habit is a really, really great book about how we as people, we default to habits. And so, for example, if I create a positive habit for my personal life or my professional life, then that can help benefit the business. So if every day the first thing I do when I get to work is I make a cup of coffee and I visit with my staff, that can be a constructive habit that's positive. But if I always start off reading my email and then not getting anything done for two and a half hours, maybe that's a negative habit that is draining the business and my success. So the author Charles Duhigg in The Power of Habit, he talks a lot about creating habits the same way I think some people are familiar with Mark Zuckerberg, the founder of Facebook. He talks about, you know, he always wears the same outfits because he doesn't want to drain his his um, emotional energy for unnecessary decisions, right? What he wears doesn't really matter. He minimizes his um, his choices to create better habits. Another book I loved, Power of Less. So if you've ever considered kind of stripping down the clutter in your life, both physically and then mentally, that can really help you have more energy to lead your staff. I'm seeing Simon Sinek in the chat. Simon Sinek, um, power, uh, is it the power of why? Why? Um, Simon Sinek, you can see him on TED Talks. He's wonderful. His books are wonderful. Um, Mitchell's mentioning uh, the leadership challenge. So I haven't read that one, Mitchell. Do you know the author or do you want to link to Amazon so we can make sure we get the right one? I feel like leadership challenge might be a generic enough title that there could be some confusion. Um, Dory's saying she's been trying to be a human sponge during this time, even though she's technically not able to work right now because she's furloughed. Once we are back um, at the pool, it will be detrimental to have not invested the time. Absolutely. I completely agree. Um, I love the pool aid talks. Thank you. And you're doing the swim whisperer training. So swim angelfish. That's exciting. We're going to have swim angelfish here next week, Monday, April 20th. Perfect. Thanks, Mitchell, for popping that link in the chat box. Um, what else? She's book reading is tough, Dory says. You also have become a homeschool teacher. I'm sure many people on this chat are homeschooling their children, and that adds an extra layer of stress and exhaustion, right, to our creative powers right now. So um, Dory's also saying she got to hear Joey live at the Association of Aquatic Professional Conference. So it was that, I assume that was last month, February, I guess two months ago now in Frisco. Texas. So welcome those of you who are just joining. You're not late. We're just hanging out. We're talking leadership books this morning or blogs or TED Talks or YouTube videos. If you want to add any leadership talks to the chat box that you have enjoyed, we can create a resource on the show notes later. I will update them with everything you put in the chat box so that we can share. Karen just mentioned Friday Forward, lots of messages in your inbox. Perfect. I'll share a couple more that I have pinned in the show notes. So I mentioned the um, Power of Habit, which I like, The Power of Less, then more personal development books. So two books I read uh, in 2017 that were very formative for me. 
The first was Quiet by Susan Cain, which is about introverts in a large world that can't stop talking. So we're a very extroverted society, very flashy society, celebrity driven society. What does it mean in the workplace when you have somebody who's quiet and not as per participatory in non-essential kind of social aspects? So I would identify as an introvert and I loved Quiet by Susan Cain. A similar book I loved is called The Highly Sensitive Person by Dr. Elaine Aaron. That's also pinned in the show notes. And that one talks about how there are different degrees of what's called sensory processing sensitivity. And that's the way that a person such as me, for example, um, if I'm trying to work and an alarm is going off outside or my husband is, um, you know, cleaning up the living room, it's very distracting to me. I like singular focus. I'm in a room right now by myself. The door is closed. I can only focus on the camera and then I go to the chat box and then back to the camera. So how do we cope and improve our abilities to work when there's diversions and intrusions um, that we just we have to learn to manage. So I thought that was a really great book for me. Let us know if you're just joining us other leadership books that you like or blogs few others that I love, The Carrot Principle was a great book that I read probably 12 or 14 years ago. I know Joey's going to talk a lot about carrot versus stick, so I'm going to leave that to Joey. One that I recently heard on a podcast that I'm super excited to read, I haven't actually read it yet, is called The Happy Campers. So I spent 10 years going to sleepaway summer camp. Uh, on a lake in Ontario. And as I, I was a camper for six years, and then I was a leader in training, counselor in training, a team lead for counselors for four years. And that was very formative for me. That camp has been around, Camp Oconto has been around for almost 100 years. And they have a formative leadership program to really develop you as a person. And that it definitely informed my leadership in aquatics. And so this book, Happy Campers, is also uh, taking the essence of summer camp and some of the business aspect and the social aspects and making them applicable to traditional workplaces. So I think there's a lot that we would find beneficial. So welcome, Brianna is here from Coronado, California. If you're just joining us, please let us know your favorite leadership resources, whether that is a book, whether that is a webinar, a podcast, a email newsletter, a Facebook page. I want to put together a list in our show notes of everything great that Joey shares with us, as well as everything great from this community that we can share with each other, whether it's now or whether you come back to this list a year from now. Um, so Luis is saying he's been very blessed to have a coworker who's been a great mentor and giving him a sense of direction. I wish she would write a book, but unfortunately, I don't think he has the time anytime soon. Give a shout out to Ray, as he, Ray Ray, as he likes to be called. I think that's so, so valuable, Luis, to have a great mentor. I think we all suffer from that problem that when we're good at something or when we're giving of our time, we're rewarded with having more of our time taken by giving uh, be, by being given more work and more responsibility. So it's wonderful when you have a mentor that can lead you, that can guide you, that you can bounce ideas off of. And I hope that um, anybody in this webinar can find a mentor, whether it's locally or not, maybe regionally or internationally, right? I know I've done mentoring with people in other provinces by phone, by email, by text, both informally, just hanging out, chatting like this, as well as formally right? It's my job to give back what I've learned. We can all benefit our industry. We can all benefit each other. So I think that's so appropriate, Louise, that you've had a, a great mentor. And so if anyone else has any, any other tips like that, I think that's great to share. Good morning. I see Kristen here from Strathmore, Alberta. Marcy is here from High River, Alberta. Leanne is here from High Level, Alberta. So we're going all the way up the province. Elizabeth from Virginia, Jessica from Chandler, Devin is adding seven habit, excuse me, seven habits of highly effective people, and welcome from uh, Northport, Florida. Peggy's here from Chattanooga, Tennessee. Ben is here from ABC First Aid and Aquatics in Toronto. So Ben agrees with me, attending summer camp for many years and then working in a supervisory and management role really developed those leadership skills. Awesome. 
Angela's here from Oakland, Kristen from Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. Katie's also recommending uh, replace thyself is a mantra when it comes to leadership, train others so I can be replaced in a good way. Absolutely. I heard about a book recently that actually echoes something we did at camp, which was all leaders eat last. So at summer camp, there would be two counselors per table with 10 or 12 kids, and we would not eat until every child had been served as a customer service piece, as a leadership piece. And I did recently hear of a book similar to what you're describing, Katie, which talked about the leader being last because they should be replaceable in the best way possible. They should grow their people, grow others' leadership capacity so that they're not the focus of the attention. Nicole's here from San Diego, California. Cody from Clarksville, Tennessee. Um, Katie's saying it's not a book, but it's a saying, but I think that we can connect them. There's probably several books that argue for the same thing. Uh, Megan's here from Sheboygan, Min Michigan. Uh, Simon Sinek book, so leaders eat last. Okay, so a couple people have mentioned that. Natalie's here from, uh, sorry, Natalie's here also seconding Simon Sinek. So lots of great books from Simon Sinek. You can also see him on TED Talks on YouTube. Kaylee's here from North Bend, Oregon. Larissa from Portland, Oregon. Jean from Acton, Michigan. So welcome everyone. If you're just joining us, you're not late. We start a few minutes after the hour. Right now we're doing welcome. So let us know where you're from, your state, your city, your province, your country, if you're international. That's really nice for our presenter today, Joey Resnack, to know where you're from and get a sense of audience. We're also sharing leadership resources. So do you have a favorite book that has changed you, that has impacted you? Is there a blog that you love to follow with leadership tips? Is there a newsletter that you get delivered? Is there a website with great resources? Let's put all those in the chat box. I will add them to the show notes later today. The show notes are currently pinned in the chat box and you, you can see some of my favorite books that I've mentioned. So we've got Shelby from Regina. So Sarah is asking about the chat notes at the end. So there's two ways to access the chat notes at the end. So basically, if you ever want to re-watch the entire webinar, you can see the chat box as a side ribbon. That is an option. I don't recommend it. I do it for you guys. And what I do is when I look at the webinar recording, so at the end of this session, the first thing I do, I don't stop go, I don't go to the bathroom, I immediately download the file so I don't lose it. That's my first thing. Then I go to upload it on YouTube privately so I can rewatch it. And then I go back and those same show notes that are currently pinned in your chat box, I go back and I update them. So for example, if you go and look at the show notes for Friday, which I I will pop in the chat box in just a moment, you will see that I have further updated it with everything we discussed in Tim's Q&A. So when Tim Auerhan on Friday spent 45 minutes asking questions, I went back to the chat box and I added all of those links into the show notes. So when you see the show notes right now, 10 minutes before Joey starts, it is the stage show notes with the information I have already from Joey, from me, from other resources. Later today or tomorrow, Tuesday, I will flesh that out further with all of the books and resources that have been mentioned in the chat box. So you can bookmark that page and come back to it, but you'll want to make sure you refresh the page or clear your cookie cache to make sure you get all of the resources. And that's a value added, as I was saying at the beginning of the webinar, these webinars will exist on YouTube and posterity. They're not going to be monetized. They're always going to be free. Everybody donated their time. So you can save those video recordings to a playlist. You can save them to a watch later. You can refer them to colleagues. But please also use the show notes because the show notes are hugely valuable in addition to the webinar. They complement each other. So those of you that attended Tim's session on Friday, he provided a great resource. He mentioned in the chat, okay, Katie, I will send you a prime directives activity sheet. He did not provide it to webinar participants in live time. It was something that came up. He emailed me over the weekend and that download is now available on that show notes page. It was not there until I added it yesterday. 
Okay, so you can always check back, Sarah. Hopefully that answers your question. So you can get the chat notes by seeing the chat in the ribbon in the recording, or I grab all of the links and I put them in the uh, show notes. So Shelby's here from Regina. Matt is here from Reston, Virginia. I've been to Reston, Reston Town Center. Boulder, Sarah's here from Boulder, Colorado. Paul from Reno, Nevada. Rachel from Chicago, Illinois. Uh, so Sarah, uh, hope you found the show notes. So the show notes for today are pinned. There is a blue box right now that is pinned. It says pool aid webinar, fun, motivating your aquatic team. That is for today's speaker, Joey Rusnak. Okay. Um, we've got Sherry here from Portland, Texas. Cassidy here from Markham, Ontario. Lynn from Allentown, Pennsylvania. I'm just scrolling. Cameron from Waukegan, Illinois. Deb from Seattle. On Alaska, Wisconsin. Erica from Dallas. If you're just joining us, we're ticking up there in numbers. Please let us know where you're from, any leadership resources that you enjoy. I was sharing some of my favorites. So if you click on the show notes for today, I was mentioning a few different books that I enjoy. Sorry. Not sick, just, you know, Monday morning. It snowed again here last night, so we're not getting any warmer weather this week. A couple other books I mentioned on my list in the show notes that I enjoy. So I've got The Giving Tree by Shel Silverstein, which I think is such a powerful leadership lesson. If you've never read The Giving Tree, either at camp or with children, that is just a great, easy, lighthearted book, I think, that has a lot of lessons that we can share. I talked about Happy Campers, the book that's on my list to read in the next couple months. A couple business books I added also to the list of my favorite books. Um, Profit First is a good business book. The Paradox of Choice, I just read this a couple weeks ago. Super, super interesting to learn about people who are what's called maximalist. So that person who shops for, let's say, a new sofa for three months and they look at a thousand sofas and they compare fabrics and price. And then I'm what's called a satisficer. So I will look perhaps for 15, 20 minutes when I'm satisfied that the parameters that I have set have been reasonably met in a way that is not going to waste my time, I make a decision and move on. So I'm a satisficer. And he talks about satisficers versus maximalists and how we can have too many choices. And that actually ruins our level of satisfaction when we make a choice because there's too many choices. A couple of blogs I also put on the show notes that I enjoy. So I like Liz Ryan. She is on LinkedIn as well as her own website. She's called, her business is called The Human Workplace. And I found her website very, very helpful when I was looking for a job about four years ago. Her perspective of how dry administrative roles can be more human, more humane with employees and leadership. I thought was really, really valuable and not pool specific. So I was able to bring a lot of strategies into my management work. A couple other blogs I mentioned on there, Rising Tide Society. Some of you might be familiar with that. There are local chapters in a lot of places in North America, Highly Sensitive Refuge. If you're just joining us, pop your own favorite leadership books or blogs in the chat box. That's on topic with what Joey's going to be presenting on today. I want to Scroll back and get some other names. We've got people who've joined us since I last scrolled. Deb from Seattle, Erica from Dallas, Samantha from Morris Township, New Jersey, Austin, Texas, Brody's here, Amanda from Atlanta, Georgia, Prairie du Sac, Wisconsin, Arvada, Colorado, Ashley's here, Austin, Texas, High Volume Committee, Jill from Wharton, Maryland, Denison, Texas, Northport, Florida, Trish is here, Charlottesville, Virginia, Montrose, Colorado, all of these little Colorado bedroom communities around Denver I've been to because we've spent a lot of time with my in-laws in Colorado. Mount Lake Terrace, Washington, Cheryl from Boone, North Carolina, Aaron from Arlington. Oh, you're filling in for Evan today, welcome. Damaris from Philadelphia, Philly, Cindy from North Carolina, Spartanburg, South Carolina, Maine, We've got uh, Danita from Derby, Kansas, Hamiota, Min Manitoba, Bonnie. Uh, Blue Wave School is here. I believe that's the UK. Welcome. Petty Aquatic Center in New Jersey. K 
Kim is here from Hawkesbury or saint Savel, Quebec, Plano, Texas. Um, Ashley Minos, Farmers Branch. Katie Cleesby is here from Virginia. Welcome. Elizabeth from Baltimore. Kate's here from Iowa City. Lots of Katie's in the chat today. <laughs> Golden, Colorado. Lots and lots of Katie's. London, UK. Hello, Marjan, or whomever is here. North Van, Andrea Campbell, El Segundo. Um, Regina, The Fish Philosophy, Larissa. Is that a book? The Fish Philosophy, it sounds fascinating. Gretna is here from Toronto. So welcome everyone. We will start in a minute or two. I'm just gonna give people a chance to get settled in. What will happen with every webinar, I will do a short introduction of myself. Then I will introduce Joey. Uh, Joey will be presenting for almost one hour today. So now's a good chance to go grab some water, grab a soda, grab you know snacks. He will be presenting lots of great content today. So you have a minute or two to get organized. I am gonna also post the show notes in the chat box. And I'm also going to, excuse me, not the show notes, the call-in numbers. I always do these too late. So let me go ahead and put the call-in numbers in. And Joey, I will also text those to you. So phone access. If at any point you lose the video link, use the link to come back in or you can call in. So let me go ahead, I'm gonna put a Canada number. Then I will put a US number. So for your participant pin, you would call into this number and get the audio live. So this will be a call in for Canada. And then I'm gonna scroll back down. It's got lots of people joining us. And then a call in for the United States we need. I'm gonna give you Chicago today. Oops, oh, I've copied almost all of them. So I'll just do that. And then you will need the participant pin. Perfect. And Joey, I will take a photo and then I'll text this to you once you start so you have it. Whoops. Sorry, guys. We're preparing for any possible tech issues. You never know. It's been a steep learning curve, but so far so good. Okay, so let me just go back quickly, see what's happened in the chat box. Uh, so Christine is saying the fish is a book and short presentation. So if you have a link, if you can pop that in the chat box, I'll grab that later for the show notes. Colleen is back home today. So hope good luck with the power. Good luck with my broadband. My husband is not playing Xbox, he's going to work. So that helps my broadband for sure. Uh, we've got Charleston, Jody's here from Tucson, John's here from Boston, uh, John's here from SUNY Del High, upstate New York, Attleboro, I know where Attleboro is, actually my roommate from grad school lives in North Attleboro, like near Gillette Stadium. We've got a link from Stephanie, thank you, we've got Casper, Wyoming, Linda from Toronto, Newtown, Connecticut, Chesapeake, Virginia, um, Who Moved My Cheese, yes, I've also read that many, many years ago, also recommend that one. Uh, Creston, Danville, Virginia, pretty much all over. I think we've got almost every state represented. Springfield, Montana, Brock University, St. Catharines, uh, West Hartford, Connecticut, Greenwich, Margie. Okay, welcome everyone. I think I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna start my introduction then I'll introduce Joey so we can get going. I wanna give you guys the most amount of time with Joey. Uh, he's kindly offered to present and he'll be able to do a Q&A at the end. So welcome everyone, my name is Katie Crisdale. It is currently Monday, April 13th, so 2020. We're a couple weeks into this COVID crisis. We're also a couple weeks into these webinars, so thanks for being here. We have webinars all this week, all next week, and I'm hard at work, I have presenters lined up for two more weeks, so I'm gonna be rolling out those registration links this week. Um, thanks for being here. Please make sure you've got access to the show notes for today's session. They are pinned in the chat box. That is the blue hyperlinked address for today. Any resources I had from Joey are available there, including the PowerPoint slides that he's kindly provided. Additional resources, I will go into the chat box later. After, with the recording, I will download all of the leadership books, blogs, um, YouTube episodes you've recommended and I'll pop those in the show notes. So that's a great page to pin. Okay, 
So thanks for being here today. I want to introduce Joey Rusnak. So Joey, I was connected with about two years ago now, and I want to share this story because I think this is so indicative of aquatics and so indicative of Joey. So Joey invited me to an in-service last year when I was in Toronto. So I'm originally from Ottawa, Ontario. I went to the University of Toronto when I worked in Toronto for seven years. I now go back and forth between Alberta and other provinces when I teach. So I get it. I don't remember if it was a call or an email from Joey and he just said, hey, do you want to come to our in-service? And only other aquatic professionals would appreciate. Of course, I want to come to an in-service, right? And it was a really interesting in-service that he was running with management team at his organization. And they were looking at blind spots, including a ripple activity where they had somebody flutter kicking at the surface and then looking at their scanning zones, right? Such a great activity. I learned a ton. I was thrilled to meet everyone at his organization. I love going to in-services and that's such a cool thing, right? Who else would invite someone else to come to their job for two hours? But that's, that's exactly what this industry is about. So Joey Rusnak, hopefully you guys know from Lifeguard Authority, the Facebook group, as well as his website. I've linked those in the show notes. If you're new, Joey Rusnak, his bio is he's a popular presenter across North America, educating and inspiring individuals to do better. He's had the privilege to lead many teams in various recreation departments for indoor, outdoor, waterfront, aquatic operations, community programs, community development, etc. He seeks new and innovative ways to engage communities and teams and to prevent, prevent and eliminate drowning. His personal mantra is connect, collaborate, and contribute. Most recently, this is a big one, you guys, Joey was named by Aquatics International Magazine to the 2020 Power Issue for his work with Lifeguard Authority and elevating the status of lifeguards as professionals. Okay, so I want to say a big welcome to Joey Rusnak. I'm going to go offline. I'll be in the chat box and I'll be listening. Uh, he's going to present for close to an hour. So welcome, Joey. Thank you so much. Before I get into the slides, I just want to do a big thank you to Katie. And I have not been tuning into the pre-shows, but I was just listening to the pre-show now. And if you're not logging on early, you definitely want to start doing that. So today, Katie was talking about leadership and books and resources and tons of stuff. And everyone in the chat, you guys were contributing lots of ideas as well. <clears throat> um, one thought I want to just kind of add to the conversation that happened that I have this conversation with a lot of people that I mentor and I say, how much money did you put into getting educated? You know, people put in tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars into getting educated. We get our job and then we stop investing in ourselves. So one thing that was a big change in my career was looking at my budget and putting, I put $3,000 a year into personal and professional development so that I can be a better me. So that is not just a financial thing, that's a time thing. So look at the list that Katie's gonna send out with tons of um, books and resources and you have to carve out maybe some time in your professional day to invest in yourself. So Katie, I loved everything that you were um, sharing there as well. So thank you for that. <clears throat> I'm going to just um, ask you to put a yes if you can see the slides. I just wanna make sure that they're up for you guys can all see in the chat. Great. So today we're talking about fun and um, motivating kind of aquatic teams. How do we get everyone excited to be at work? If you've heard me speak before, you might have heard a session, Carrots Are Better Than Sticks. That's really the foundation of this session. It's one of the more popular ones that I present when I talk to aquatic professionals across North America. And this one's especially like important to me because um, my mom's been really good um, growing me up about this whole work hard, play hard philosophy. And I was able to kind of adapt that into the workplace. And I think that when you play really hard, you can have a higher standard when you work. So we're gonna talk about the play element and look at some research as well um, for that. So what we're gonna do is, here's my information. I'm sure Katie's gonna link it. The one thing I ask is if you have questions following the session, um, that you ask them on the Facebook group, our Lifeguard Authority Facebook group, so that when I answer it, other people can benefit from it as well. So if you're in our Facebook um, community, can you just type the word community in the chat so that we already know if you're already in our Facebook 
group called Life of Lifeguard Authority. So see all of those people typing it. So Lifeguard Authority group, we're just over 2,500 people from across the world. I get uh, great conversations with people from uh, Australia, in Africa, different countries, in Russia even. Um, but you can post uh, benchmarking, you can post articles if you see them, if you have a question or a problem. Um, you can go there for answers um, really quickly as well. So definitely join that. And we've got some really cool things coming up on Friday, and I'll tell you more about this at the end. Um, Dr. Justin Semsrat is going to be talking to us about COVID and what it means to our aquatics industry. So again, my journey with carrots. <clears throat> so again, I, I said I had that kind of foundational thing from my home life, my personal life. But also when I first started, I was young. I was like 20, turning 21 full time. I had our biggest pool in our community and a, a smaller um, sister pool. And I was young, I was dumb, I thought I knew everything. And I had really some hard lessons learned about how I went into doing things and ran into some walls. Luckily, I worked for a great um, person, JC, and she really kind of encouraged me to say, when we have problems and we need to see behavior change on our team, we don't need to grab sticks and beat them into the direction that we want them to go. She really pushed me to say, oh, how are you going to make this fun? How are you going to make this activity um, fun? And I had not experienced that in my professional life. So it was kind of weird and hard for me to get on board with that. But then I realized that that really was the root of how I was brought up and I had all these creative things. So it started to become more natural as I had a mentor to help me figure it out. So um, this presentation is gonna walk through how we see behavior change in the workplace and how we have fun and celebrate our team in the workplace and really that it makes good business sense as well. So our quick session today, I've got like 41 slides, so we're gonna move pretty quick. Um, through it because I want to try to get as much info out to you as we can. So I want to talk about these top employers and I didn't make this up on my own. This is some, some research that I've done to say what are they doing? How do we apply that in the recreation world? And for those that don't know, a big part of my career for over 12 years, I also led teams in fitness and community programs and camps. And all of these ideas that I'm sharing with you um, work in some of these other um, components as well. So top employers, how do we mimic them? How do we look at obstacles as opportunities? How do we explore how our communication and how we talk about ourselves and our team is gonna impact that culture? So one thing I'm gonna share is I'm not really watching the chat because then I'm always gonna be turning this way and I'm kind of like squirrel, squirrel. So Katie's agreed to monitor the chat and as questions comes up, she has full uh, authority to just jump in and uh, bump in with a question. I really want this to be a dialogue the best we can. So this was a big kind of guiding philosophy for me and it's this whole concept that <clears throat> When I was younger, I thought leadership kind of was a call to triumph, right? I felt really good, you know, when I was young, dumb, and didn't think that in the time, but I really acted that way with how I was leading. And I really kind of grew and matured through um, some blunt feedback from some mentors and supervisors that I had. And then when I really came to the point where I realized that leadership was really the ability to empower others and to really set them up to make a difference on their teams and to set them up with making a difference in the communities. That's when things really changed for me. And I started to see change in the culture of the workplaces that I had the privilege of leading. So really think about how do, as we go through these slides and things, it's not about how do I do this initiative, but I really want you to think in the, thing, in the sense of how do I get my team to buy into this and start doing this on their own? You know, I'm lazy by nature, so I'm always about delegating. I'm always about trying to get other people on board to do things um, themselves. And some people interpret that as great leadership. I think I'm just lazy sometimes. But really think, how do I get my frontline supervisors to buy into these, these factors? <clears throat> I want to address some of the objections that I know are going to come in to your brain as we go through this. And that's going to be, well, that's great that you're doing that, but I work for an organization that has all of these um, – rules and restrictions. I'm not allowed doing this. I'm not allowed doing that. We've got all of these standards and things. The reality is whether you work for a municipality, a private company, a nonprofit, you're going to have some of these barriers. If all you do is bitch and mind, moan and complain about those barriers, that's all you're going to do. But really try to find ways to go around it. We all are kind of in this image, um, crumpled up papers within our operations. I really want to encourage you and empower you and challenge you to act like the CEO of your team here, what do I have control over and how do I make my team pop?
How do you make my, your team within the boundaries that you have? How do you adapt and overcome and make that work within your organization? Because the tough reality is we have these recognition motivation programs, but they're often focused on our full-time folk within our organizations. And unfortunately, a lot of them forget that we have thousands of part-time team members. You know, put an agree in the chat if you agree with me that your organization has, you know, money for professional development for full-time or a recognition program for full-time or these types of things. So I see a lot of agrees coming. So our part-time team members are slipping through the cracks. Now, spend time and effort trying to advocate and change that culture within your organization, but spend more of your time just being that culture, being that like thermometer and setting the tone of what you want um, to happen within your part-time team, part -time team culture and making sure that they have what they need. <clears throat> so staff versus team, I wanna share a quick story with you. So let's go back to a few years ago, I'm, I'm working on a team. One of my mentors, Juanita Bushleb, uh, she might be watching this, I'm not sure. <clears throat> she, I would always use the word my staff, you know, the staff member would do this. And I never thought of it as a bad thing. But one day she challenged me to say, Joey, I want you to change your word. I want you to call them your team members and your team. And at the time, I'll be honest with you, I was kind of like resistant to it. I was kind of like, well, I don't think staff's a derogatory way. I don't mean it in a, in a mean way. Um, so I was kind of like, you know, you kind of had these crazy lady moments with her, but they often turned out to be good for my career. But what happened was she said, you know what, try for a couple months. And if at the end of the couple months you don't notice a change, then go back to doing what you want to do. So I said, okay, I'll try it. So I started using the word team and team member, just changing my word. And I encouraged my frontline supervisors to do that. And it transformed how we interacted with each other. I couldn't believe the power of a word and how we worked together. So what happened was I started saying team members and our team and this team member is a great equalizer, but also my frontline supervisors and my programmers, they weren't coming to me being like, oh, this staff member, they blah, 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 insert pitch fest here. Um, I guess there should be a PG warning on this session. I'm sorry, I should clean up my language. But so what happened was they would come in and they would start by saying uh, my team member and it immediately diffused all of that frustration and it really changed the dynamic of how we started working. So I started changing my words and Kelly Martinez in the city of Phoenix um, corrected me on the word patron. She said, use the word guest and try that. And she in turn switched to team and staff. And we noticed that it started changing a lot of how we work. So I wanna get back to <clears throat> some of the actual tangible things that I'm doing or have done in the past to motivate and get my team members excited in the workplace. So I mentioned before that some of this is based on research. So what I did is I, a while ago, I went back and I said, who are the top employers in North America? Who are these companies that everyone's looking at saying they're the best? And then why, why are they the best? So I researched a bunch of articles and I tried to boil down to what are the things that they're doing that make them the best? And can we adopt those principles in our workplaces to become the best ourselves? And no, you know what? We don't have money to do all kinds of crazy things that some of them do, but we can adjust it and make it our own in some ways. So a lot of these ideas that I've come up with are really based on that foundational research and proven track record for some of these other companies. So one of the big components of this is our environment. <clears throat> so we um, renovate our houses. You know, recently I, this is, you know, my office house area and I painted it all lighter colors because I wanted to feel better about the space that I was in. And when we're kids, we like forts and to decorate it and to have a kind of, kind of a cool, fun vibe with things. But oftentimes we walk into our workplaces and it's like, it's stagnant. It looks like an institution or a hospital and we have those little, little teamwork photos, photos with like, a picture of a tree and some word and some phrase or something. It's very kind of corporate. So um, these, these companies like Google and Facebook, they're iconic for having fun workplaces and a space that you want to be in. So I'm gonna challenge you when you do get back to work or even now you can sit and visualize what your workplace looks like and think, is this really an environment where people are gonna be creative and fun and have a good time in? Now, <clears throat> I'm not saying to go paint clown walls and all kinds of crazy things, so for example, I've had challenges with some facility managers say, no, you can't paint this room this color because the public can see through the guard office window um, in the space. So great, those walls, everyone can see, but can I do anything I want on this wall that only my team can see? And then we found a common ground and we did that. So look for painting those types of things. When I had camp teams, 
I would look at the space that we would take over for the office and I'd take out the standard chairs. And sometimes I would just put in beanbag chairs or low sitting kind of fun chairs, kind of like what you see in this picture. And not very expensive, but just something fun that they can you know, make the space their own or go and spend a little bit of money and decorate a theme each season at your outdoor pool. <clears throat> I don't know if you guys can see, but I have a chalkboard. Um, in my house, that's my creative space, but I use the chalkboard paint in workplaces as well now. So if you have a bulkhead or a flat wall in your guard office or team space, paint it with chalkboard paint. And one of the things that I used to do um, is paint or write up motivational quotes or fun things like that each week on the chalkboard. So it was always changing. There was kind of this passive <clears throat> idea of motivating them. And then guess what? I started doing it with a team member. And then one day I said, hey, why don't you come up with quotes? And then it just became something that happened every day and I didn't do it. Sure, we had DJ Khaled quotes up and Drake lyrics, but they found all of these motivating, inspiring things in current culture that I would never have thought of to put up that really connected with our frontline team differently. So I'm gonna challenge you to look at your spaces and think how you can make that environment more fun for your team. <clears throat> I had to switch out my mug for my orange one. I got a text from Mark saying, why don't you have the Lifeguard Authority Show coming soon uh, mug out. So health, I wanna to talk to you guys about health. The research was overwhelming about how when you invest in the health and well-being of your team, the, the return on that is, is huge. So top companies are putting gyms in their workplaces. They have health professionals that work with their team because they know when someone feels better about themselves and they feel like a better person, they're more motivated, they have more energy, they're more focused and their businesses thrive. So no, we can't always do that, but many of our facilities might have a gym or maybe you're listening to this and you have a water park. Is there a gym that you can say, great, I'm gonna give you free passes for your team. Can I get free monthly passes for my team to go use your gym? So maybe you could get creative with how you do that as well. If you, if you don't have the opportunity for a gym, maybe you have to just become even more creative in how you can invest in the health and wellness. And um, I know for myself, when I start working out or going for walks and doing it, I feel I can tackle more and I'm more focused as well. So here are some off the cuff ideas that I'm gonna share with you that I've done in the past. So the main photo on the bottom, that's uh, me before I ate me, uh, is a water polo tournament day that we did. Um, we challenged other facilities to, um, there was a, in our portfolio facilities, there was a lake that had things. So free resource, I just had to get some signatures to get our team to go have fun on the waterfront, stand up paddle boards, kayak. So maybe there's something in your portfolio of facilities within your organization that they can do. I've gone curling, I've gone tubing, other things that have happened. <clears throat> we have a volleyball tournament there. That was super fun. They love doing that. And, um, they love laughing at me, try to be athletic because I'm athletically challenged. It never really works that well. So that's always a good time as well. So I want to talk to you about get active challenges. So get active challenges are great. It's just you coordinating ahead of time how you want your team to be active. And maybe you have nine weeks in your season. So you're planning things throughout your season. Here's a get active challenge from 2017. We got a, a hashtag. We got a big thing on social media. <clears throat> and the, the big culminating activity at the end of this was to do a race. So we did a 5k walk, crawl or run because we wanted to be inclusive of those that might not be able to run or those that wanted to walk or if you're really out of shape and you want to crawl the 5k. So we had fun with the title. And I just went to a local um, running shoe store that had a running club and I got donated those like number bibs. So throughout the years, people um, signed up and committed to join our um, 5k at the end, they got a number so they could all wear it and we ran um, around this course that we were working towards. We had challenges every couple weeks, so burpees, push-ups, things like that, and you did it as a buddy. So um, this is Jen, who was my buddy that summer. And I, have you guys heard, um, put, a, put a yes if you've heard of these prom proposals that are happening with youth these days. So they're planning these like extravagant prom proposals with each other. So what happened is, because we did a buddy challenge, we, we started encouraging them to, you know, get a buddy ahead of the summer. So in like June, we would say, do you have your buddy yet? Like find your buddy during training for this thing. We had this big lead up. So a couple a couple years in, we found that people were actually doing these extravagant like buddy pro 
composal style things. So they would plan this big thing at work to ask someone to be their work at a challenge buddy. So it kind of took out a life of its own, which was really fun. And in the next photo here is just to show you that I think um, make it big in your space. So really loud. This is craft paper that I got from camp and I find this is the door and hallway in one of the buildings that I worked in. We just put that up. Someone on an off rotation did it up so people could track and journal their progress on that. So as people walked to and from, they saw everyone was doing it in the progress and it really encouraged them to get in on it as well. Um, the, the corner there, I'm pointing to the screen as though you can see what I'm pointing at. I don't know if you can um, see this or not, but right here, the 150. So Canada um, celebrated a few years ago, 150 years um, of being a country. So we randomly came up with the idea to um, do treading water with a 20 pound brick as a team for 150 minutes over the summer. So if you had 30 seconds after your lesson, someone would bring you the brick and you would do it and we would track it. And uh, it started taking a life of its own. And this one uh, team member could do 15, 30 minutes at a time. So he did a lot of the work for us. Uh, but again, and it pulled us together and we worked on fitness while doing something that we achieved together. Um, my advice to you is when you do these, don't reward the person who wins and does the most fitness, reward participation. So we would say if you completed the challenge, you got a ballot and you can get an extra ballot if you did like the higher version or the more intent version, intense version. And then those ballots went in and we had creative ways. So we would throw them over a railing. They would all fall down and whichever one was close. And we would film this on social media to show them. So find creative ways. And then our prize, every supervisor just donated um, two movie passes and popcorn card thing that you could go with your buddy to the movies, which is not very active, but it was something that they could do um, together. So again, we rewarded participation in the program, not, necessary, not necessarily the results of the program. Other ideas you can do to make it fun is this is an underwater MP3 player, so it plays sound through your cheekbones which is really cool. So I just bought these myself and I use it when I go swimming at the community YMCA close to my house. But uh, I have a set at work as well. And in the summer I have two so that one can go at my outdoor pool and my indoor pool. And this is just, hey, if you wanna go swimming, listen to some music while you do it, just plug it in when you're done. And one of my team members keeps it um, up to date with some different uh, music. So sometimes you can encourage fitness that is gonna make your workplace more fun by just giving them something to listen to um, in the water. And I use it for my own personal use and I allow them to use it as well. And it seems to be working really well. So the next slide that I want to share with you is probably the biggest key to success and that's food. So if you've been working in aquatics, you know we like to eat and our team members like to eat. It's, it's just, I don't know if it's the chlorine or what. The, the top employers, when I did my research, a lot of the main companies really invested in this as well. They really had, um, a lot of them had chefs or free cafes and things like that. And I really started digging down into that research and I realized it's because food's a social connector. So when you have family come over that you haven't seen in a long time, then you go out for dinner, you have dinner together and that's where you connect. When you see your friends, you grab a bite to eat. It's foods where people come together. So these companies um, pay for chefs and they have family style meals um, with their team and it really builds strong bonds. Now, obviously we can't hire a chef in a rec center environment, but I really started to think, how do I get fun and creativity and how do I recognize and motivate my team with food without it breaking the bank? So I started, if you look at the, the one side doing cakes. So I started baking cakes when it was your birthday so we could celebrate you as a person outside of your professional life. And that worked really well. And then I realized that like, I don't like baking and I was just baking cakes all the time. So there was a team member, Caitlin, who's in that picture and she loved baking and she wanted to bake a lot. So I just gave her the 99 cent cake um, package. I just bought a bunch of those and she would go home and she started making, you know, Steven's cake is the music cake because he was really musical. And then Chris, he was into soccer. So she started making these really cool cakes. Another way you can do it, the bottom picture there is um, just have a cake that you do quarterly that everyone's name is on and then do some type of a fun thing with your team. But again, it's it's food, it, it helps them. Um, other big successes that I've really had with food in terms of um, low cost, high return on investment is this like summer series that I do. So we do blender week, popcorn week, waffle week and grilled cheese week. 
And the way that those work is I just bought a blender. You go on Facebook Marketplace, you can buy one for like $15. Or if your work's going to pay for something, um, one year we had so much money for a customer service fund. And instead of buying useless crap they're not going to use, we bought a blender. And then we made them blender drinks. So uh, you have ice often in your facilities. If not, ice trays are cheap and you make ice. I just started by bringing some juices in the first week and some frozen fruit the first day and making them some drinks. And then it was there and we just had to sign up and everyone just started bringing in different juices and yogurts and all kinds of crazy things. And we started getting really creative with these blender drinks and boom, 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 boom quick drink, cool off in the summer. It's great. But we only do it for one week and we talk about it leading up to it. And on a high note, one week it's done, the blender goes back in the storage room. So then we do the um, waffle week. Waffle week's like super fun. First year I did it, waffle week was a disaster. My guard offices were just destroyed with like food crap everywhere. So we got smarter. So now I buy the, the waffle pancake mix um, and I use Ziploc bags. You just pour the right amount of water in for the mix, seal the bag, mix it in your bag, cut the tip of your bag off and do that. No bowls, no mess, you're good to go. And uh, I just brought in simple syrup. It cost me like nothing to do waffle week. And they start bringing in whipped cream and berries and all of these types of things and making waffles. And the magic that happens with some of this stuff is I noticed that other management team members were coming by and being invited to come in. Oh, so-and-so makes a great waffle. And our operations teams were coming by. So it really started changing the dynamic. And then my team was making waffles for camp teams that were coming in, take one for the road and things like that. So that worked really well. So we do that popcorn week really quickly, super fun as well. Uh, Air popper, you can buy a big thing of kernels. It's really not that expensive. And uh, you just pop some popcorn. Just don't do too much at a time. Your thing will overheat as I've learned. And just get the shakers. People can bring in different shakers. My one supervisor brought in Frank's Red Hot Sauce, and we did that on popcorn, which if you've never had is delicious. Or um, the little Barber spray bottles. We put some oil in there, and you spray the popcorn, and then put the flavor shakers on. That works really well. And then you can just get those little brown paper lunch bags that you put. I don't know if you know this, um, your lunch in old school bags. And then you can even just write little messages to your team about great work. We appreciate you, or whatever you want on that, so that when they fill their bag of popcorn and they have it, usually I cut them so they're not having huge bags. Um, there's just a quick little note for them about, hey, we value you and, and a great job. So uh, grilled cheese week, bread, grilled cheese, they start getting all crazy with stuff. But again, I'm not saying you feed all of the food. All you have to do is get it started. So the first year, I put a little bit more of an investment in. But then what happened in future years, people just knew Waffle Week was coming. Someone would put up a, a sign, and now I don't buy anything, right? People just all share community, bringing parts of it together. Um, Marchin, a team member of mine that uh, was awesome, he's uh, now a supervisor at a university, running the aquatics team there. He uh, started Watermelon Wednesday. So he would just bring in a watermelon. And Watermelon Wednesdays were like awesome. Everyone looked forward to it. We took turns bringing it. I bought those little homemade popsicle kits and I would bring watermelon uh, juice in and I'd make watermelon popsicles. So we liked that. Or you can order like watermelon Jolly Ranchers or candies on uh, Amazon and you can like infuse them a little bit. So everyone looked forward to Wednesday. Halfway through the week, have a slice of watermelon. It was fun. And again, low cost, but something that became part of the culture of what we do. Now I'm going to Freezy Fridays. I see in the chat, Freezy Fridays are really good. Uh, those little Kool-Aid juice jammers, they're like diabetes in a pack. Uh, those ones are really good because you can just freeze them and you get a case and they're pretty cheap. So I like to freeze those for the freezy situations, which are really good for outdoor pools. So a, a key for this though, like I said, is don't run it forever. Don't always have popcorn. Don't always have things and maybe don't do it for a week. I do it for a week because of the way the schedule works so everyone can enjoy it. But depending on your thing, maybe you only do it for a couple of days where you know you can capture people and promote it ahead of time, make it part of your plan. And we, we schedule this ahead of time. And now we're all home and we're all trying to figure out what can I do now to make my pool successful when it opens up? Well, this is what you can do. You can sit and plan your summer. You can plan your propaganda. And I'll show you some of my propaganda quickly in a minute. Um, your signs and get it excited because it's usually the anticipation for something that makes it a success, not just like, oh, there's popcorn in the office. But like we've been talking about popcorn week and it becomes it becomes a thing of its own. And then people eat popcorn and we have the benefits of them coming together over that. 
but it, it's a it's a it becomes a tradition um, within your workplace. So you can get more out of just having it. So I want to share with you. I got some more tea for my throat because I knew I was going to get excited. So I want to share with you about some of the cheesy propaganda. I love cheesy propaganda. I put it up in the guard office and people always make fun of me. But if you see the one photo here, if you can see my mouse scrolling there, uh, we took a wall and we made the calendar for the summer and we started planning, okay, this is Watermelon Wednesday. Here's payday. Then we would say, okay, when are we doing Watermelon Week and Blender Week? And here's the other thing. If you work somewhere where you have multiple pools in your organization, you each only need to buy one thing. This pool buys a popcorn maker, that pool buys a waffle iron, this pool buys a blender. You just coordinate your schedules and then you rotate them through your organization. And then boom, for $35, you have a whole summer of fun plan. So that can work really well um, if you're partnering with an organization. So this is like some of my like posters that I did. I found this like weird frog guy online and there was a bunch of images. So I made him for my Get Active Challenge that one year. So before the summer, as soon as training started, they started seeing, so you'll see here, um, coming summer 2017. So they didn't know anything about it. I didn't say it was much. It was just like coming, people would talk about it before I even shared. And they're just like, what's with these weird frog posters everywhere? And then as it went, we started posting this challenge, that challenge, um, and we kind of had a theme to it. And people would would laugh um, about it. And there's like, you know, got your partner yet. So we would post that so people could start getting their partners ahead of time. So um, this is great. And you can plan this all right now. Reach out to a friend that's big into fitness. Do we did visual things, blah, 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 blah. So you have links and QR codes that you can do on your posters as well. These are all things you can do now while you're off to set your summer up and future summers for big success. The other thing is we have colleges here that have recreation and leisure service programs. And I always take an intern on, and this is one of the jobs I give my intern, plan fun for the summer, which is great for their own leadership and personal development, but also I don't have to do it. I just have to kind of help them come up with a fun idea and they, they put it together. So that also works well. And uh, come up with like some branding, some fun, a prize. If you have no money for a prize, then who cares? You don't need a prize try to get some buzz on social media. I haven't done it yet, but I think there's probably great opportunity to do a TikTok fitness challenge for your team all summer. They're probably all on TikTok. I'm still learning TikTok. Um, write TikTok if you're into TikTok yet on the chat. I'm curious to see who personally has it. So I just downloaded it and I'm starting to watch it. And uh, you just like, you know, you start watching videos, two and a half hours go by and you're like, oh my gosh, like what's happened here? So I'm trying to figure out how we can get TikTok happening in the lifeguard world. So stay tuned. We're going to see what we can do there with some challenges. Great. I love lots of the TikTok. So other fun things that you can do is, and these are some of my other um, fun recognition pieces in there. So water bottles, it gets really hot. Sometimes I'll buy water bottles and I'll just print custom um, messages to them and I'll tape them on like the label on the water bottle. And then I'll just walk up to them and give them some nice cold water on the deck and it'll be like, you rock, thanks for coming in, whatever you wanna do. Uh, pizza, so let's say we had a bad shift or uh, something that happened, I'll just buy like a little quick, hot and fresh $5 pizza and on the inside of the lid, I'll write a message. And then I just love putting it in the guard office and saying nothing so that when they come and someone at some point you know is going to lift up the lid to see like is there any pizza left who's is it can i have some and then on the lid it'll say great work last um, week on your shift you know have a slice on me and that type of thing works well donut boxes um work really well i had to put the Krispy cream example because tim hortons in canada which is huge they went to a clear window on the inside of or on the top of their box lid which kind of like screwed up my all my plans um, but that's okay. But if you don't have money to do some of these things, then um, there's free options that you can do as well. I'm the type of person I don't mind spending, you know, $40 a month, if that, on just some of these random things, if it makes my work experience that much better. But I know some people are tighter on budget, so get creative with free things. So water would be cheap, um, but get out of jail free card is awesome. So they love this one and make that your ultimate prize for whatever you're doing. And they basically with that get to come put it on your deck, your desk 48 hours before a shift and basically say you're working that shift. And uh, I only give out like one of these a year. So they get you on deck working 
And if you have someone with NL that the highest person in your organization that's done training, if you can get them to commit to doing this, like they still come to work that day to swim to watch you work or to see you at the top of the slide or something like that. It becomes um, a fun thing for them to be able to do. First pick, so if you do really well, then maybe they get first pick of hours on the schedule as a reward. So think about what are some of the fun, low cost, creative ways that I can um, get them involved. So I wanna talk about their happiness and the intrinsic piece here as well. Be very progressive. I recently went to uh, a development session with my employer and they brought someone in from LinkedIn to help us learn how to do better LinkedIn profiles to set our careers up for success. And I thought, wow, that's so progressive because it's probably not like when you look at it from one perspective, the smartest to say like, here's how you can get better jobs. But they're just so confident in themselves as a great employer and they really are an awesome employer that they're saying we want to invest in you and when you're successful we're successful so take that same approach with your team members and you know that you're a first-time employer as well and you can have fun doing this with them as well so set a tone of self-growth and development lead by example show them that you're doing professional development i like to try to commit twenty dollars twenty dollars <laughs> i wish 20 minutes of every professional day that I work where I watch um, a TED Talk video, a YouTube video, I read a couple pages of a leadership book. I try to commit at least that much time of my day to do that. When they see that you're investing in yourself, they might choose to do that on their off rotation and invest in themselves. And if you look in your guard office, do I have anything there that they can read and learn and grow from? Maybe now while you're off from COVID, find some of these, create links and post them so that they can scan them and watch 10, 15 minute videos that might inspire them to do better. And understand that training and development is not an expense, it's an investment into your team. Free courses and training, so come up with um, writing a better resume or how to do better interviews, run little mini workshops for them to come and learn how to do this so that when they graduate from school, they are set up for success going into the workforce because we're really helping build the future leaders or, they're gonna look for advancement within your organization, help set them up for success with that. So look for outside of the box, creative opportunities and create opportunities for them to learn and grow and celebrate kind of that growth outside of work at work as well. One of the things that I love doing as well is when they all start getting their acceptance to the different universities, I'll put them up. So I'll put their name, the logo from the university, and I usually make fun of their program. So if it's like some technical engineering thing, I'll say they're going here to this university for transformers or something like that. People see it, they feel good, we celebrate that. And uh, celebrating those advancements is good. Every meeting I have with any team, we do some of our meeting to celebrate um, our celebrations. So someone might say, I got engaged. Someone might say, I got my license. And a lot of the time they start saying, oh, I got this lifeguard qual, I did this. I taught my first this. And then other people want to start doing more of those. So that's also another way to make things fun. The big thing here is that you make it special. So here's a certificate from a place that I went to, and you can give a certificate to a lot of people and it could mean nothing. I mean, when I was in school, I think I got most improved student like six months in a row. Like I felt pretty stupid at that point. So it didn't mean much to me because it was just a drone thing. You go at school, you just walk across the stage. They didn't make it fun and exciting for me. But in this case study, they made this like super fun. They said, you know, there's a rookie of the year. They had a plaque in the office. And like, it was a big like thing there to get rookie of the year. They talked about it ahead of time. And you worked, I worked my butt off. Like I was raking sand on a beach to just show that I was taking initiative because I wanted to be the best. I was there for training, I busted my butt. And I got rookie of the year. So my name is up in that guard office. And when I meet people that worked at that beach, I'm like, I was rookie of the year. And they're like, whoa, no way, seriously? Like, that's like, that's pretty cool. Uh, I had to share it with Dan Owens. Shout out to Dan, we both got it. He's awesome too. But uh, this paper meant the world to me when I got it. Again, you can give a piece of paper that's a piece of paper, or you can give someone something that means the world to them. Same thing with bead programs. I went to my hairdresser and they had a bead program and I'm like, what's that box of beads? They're like, oh, if we sweep up after other people, our boss gives us a bead. I could tell immediately this chick was not feeling the beads. She was not into the beads. She was like, this is the dumbest thing I've ever seen. 
but you go to City of Phoenix and like they're like obsessive about these beads. They all have these special beads that they get. It's fun. They wear their beads. I went there. I saw their guards and I said, oh, what are those? Oh, their chest puffs out. This beads for this. This oh, this is a Becky bead. This is a Kelly bead. So they've done a great job of making beads mean something. So it's all up to you when you plan fun things at work. You have to make it special. You have to commit to that. So you have to walk the talk. You have to like do the push-ups. When I did that get active challenge, like I was like really good at eating that year, not good at pretty much anything else. So like doing push-ups and burpees with my team with my fat flying everywhere was not what I wanted to do. But I knew if I didn't do that with my team members, we're like, oh, we got five minutes, let's all do some burpees, it wouldn't work. So you have to really drive the fun at work. And I'm giving you a bunch of these little ideas, but I really want to hammer home that core philosophy of you have to make these investments. Like they don't just happen overnight. And guess what? It, some are not going to work. It's the law of averages. So you're going to do probably tons. And if you're not doing some that are failing, then you're not being progressive enough. So sometimes I do this activity that I think is going to be awesome. And then my DS team at the meetings, like, can we not do that again? Like it was bad, which is good. We celebrate the failure in the workplace because we learn, but guess what? Because of the law of averages of us doing these fun, exciting things in the workplace or fun things at training. Sometimes you're going to do an activity where you're like, this is so much fun. I want to do this at training. And then you do it and everyone's like, mm, I ain't about it. But then you do those things and then they're like, boom, a big hit. We have to push ourselves and try. So I want you to reflect right now and think, am I failing at work on anything? Like, am I, because if you're playing it safe and everything's a success, it means you're playing it safe and you're not pushing the envelope. So I like to say, no, don't just go screw everything up. And some things you can't screw up. But when it comes to trying recognition programs or fun in the workplace, it's not always going to work. And you have to be vulnerable and open to say, okay, we're not going to do that one again. So um, I want you to look at programs as opportunities as well. So look at problems not programs as opportunities so uh let's i'm going to give you some examples um in a minute but like things like cleanliness in your facility or pet peeves that you might have that you would perceive as problems how do i change those into opportunities to have some fun and excitement in the workplace so what are your opportunities so reflect right now or put in the chat some of your pet peeves is it band-aids on the pool deck you know, they don't clean the window ledges or the windows. I want you to type some of your opportunities or pain points within your organization. So I'm gonna just take a minute, hair in the drains. Let's see some of these other ones that come out. Twirling the whistles. Does anyone see them doing scum line? Oh, I hate scum line, it's dirty. Okay, the vacuum not being put or the lane ropes when people don't know how to put the lane ropes on properly and they get tangled, that one's brutal. So not having your hair tied up, Right, so there's tons of things. So not having your hair tied up, you can do a session at training where you know their hair is gonna get in the way so that they can learn it, fun things like that. Seeing guests spitting, yeah, cleaning the vacuum bag. So we have tons of them, these are pain points. So I want you to, um, and I'm gonna give you some examples in a minute and a couple slides of some of my pain points and how I turn those into to fun things as well. But <clears throat> this COVID crisis with our pool being closed is another problem. It's a problem that we're not working with our team members if your organization's closed, which I assume most of them are. So how do we turn that into an opportunity to still have good culture with our um, teams? So I just realized that my image is cutting off. So we have virtual scavenger, her, it should be hunt. Um, but some of the things that I've done with my team recently is we did a virtual house scavenger hunt. So the details are on the Lifeguard Authority Facebook page where I would give them something, they had to go in the house and find it and bring it back and their families got involved. We did work at Wednesdays, Tea Time Tuesdays with my supervisor. We did a, a Jeopardy game with them and our theme was COVID. So we had like Netflix, um, Prime, Snacks, COVID, these were the categories. So they would say like, can I have snacks for 400? So we had like fun examples of that. So we took the problem of this and made it an opportunity to connect with our team. And we had some really great opportunities and we would be finished. And what was fun is that a lot of them just stay on after and they use the open chat room to connect and, and um, catch up with each other. So that was um, a great example there. Where's my pen? Pens in the guard office, if you teach swimming lessons, I don't know where they go. You put hundreds of pens out, they all disappear. And at some point you're like, everyone must have lots of pens at home. So I don't know why they're still disappearing. But pens were like my my thing that were driving me crazy. So I had a couple of um, things that I did and 
Um, the one was when they go to the university and college shows to figure out what they want to do, I would do a contest. So I'd have like a $10 gift card to like Wendy's or something and whoever could bring back the most pens. So they would bring back like bags of pens. But then I realized that was probably bad because I was encouraging them to like steal. So I, I matured from that, but we had great pens. They're such good pens from universities everywhere that kept us going. Uh, but another one we did is a pen exchange program. So I literally had all this like cheesy propaganda that I put up that was like show pride in your pen. And like, it was, it was really cheesy, but people got into it. So what we did is I bought the crappiest pens I could find and I put labels with their names on it. And after that session, they handed me back that pen and I upgraded them. So then they went to a pen with a grip and then a pen with a clip and then a click with a grip. And uh, then we got like a nice pen and then it went all the way up till it was some like ball in like golden pen. And what was cool is like people like were so proud of their pen. Like they would just like new team members would look at like a senior team member and be like, like, have you been here a hundred years? Like look at your pen. And they would like be so productive over their pen. So again, we, we took a problem and we used it as an opportunity to kind of show a fun way to keep track of your things at work. And it worked really well. It was a lot of fun. Another one we did was band-aids and hair on the deck. So it's like, so I think that if I'm walking on deck and I see hair in the drains or hair in the pool, how many of my guards saw that hairball in the pool and didn't take initiative to do it? It would drive me crazy, like take the hair out or band-aids on the pool deck. Because if our guests are coming and they're seeing that, they're like thinking this place is disgusting and how are they going to come back? So it was like, I, I was using a stick for so many years. And then um, one day I realized I had to take a new approach. So what I did is we did a band-aid blitz and, um, Every time you saw a Band-Aid and picked it up, you got a ballot towards a prize. And you can use a free prize or paid prize, whatever you want. So then people like on their off rotation started hunting for Band-Aids on the pool deck. Or when they're walking, they would carry an extra glove and then they would see a Band-Aid because they would be walking on a rotation, um, checking the pool, checking the deck and grabbing Band-Aids. And then like, oh, I got two today, I'm doing really good. So um, what, what we were doing there is though we were conditioning them to be aware of the band-aids and then we removed the initiative program and it was a behavior that we've built. So we took something fun to create a behavior of look for band-aids when you see them, throw them out. But we used something fun to build that um, behavior into our team and that just became the norm. Same thing with hair. So I took one of those like, you know, those like water jugs that go on a, a water um, filtration thing and I filled it with like all these nasty hair clumps and it just like it looked like vomit and I put it right in the middle of the guard office so that everyone could see how gross it was and then I put the little sign on and the same kind of idea if you were out there scooping out hair balls we rewarded that to build the behavior to see them and to do it and I was just obnoxious with like trying to get them to pay attention to it and we joked about it but the point really got across and we had fun doing it. So another one was operation prevention. This is probably one of my favorite ones that uh, we did. And I'm gonna go through this really quickly because we're running a little short on time here. And what we did is we had a whole uh, vase full of army men here and we had an empty vase here. And you can see those in the picture behind here with those. And we said, all of these guys have to get over here. No man left behind. And to get a guy from here to here, you have to be observed preventing something in the pool. So catching a swim test, telling a kid to walk, helping with a life jacket on a kid, anything that was a preventative behavior, because we really wanted to encourage that prevention um, and celebrate that in our workplace. So, and you could see it and nominate each other. And then we would write your name on and track. So as you got 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, you went up in ranks. So you started as like a sergeant, major, colonel, all the way up. And then when you became an officer, we had to salute you. So here I am like saluting my team members that were like generals. And I had a rank as well. And then we had fun with it. So um, when a swim started, the deck supervisor would say to them, you know, everyone knows exactly what guard position to go to to like maximize the rotation and their breaks. So whoever outranked other people got to pick where they went um, on the rotation. Or I would come and say, hey, I need the deck bucketed or this or that. And like four people would just start like looking at each other, playing the nose game. But in that situation, they're like, I'm a lieutenant. You're like a master corporal. Like you're bucketing the deck. Get away. So then they would laugh. Oh, no, true, true, true. And then they would go on deck and start preventing. So what we did is we, we got everyone there and we um, conditioned people to really 
look for those preventions and celebrate those preventions. My lessons learned on this one though was know when to stop an initiative. So the first time I did it, I let it run too long and it got political. Oh, but I saw this, no one did that. Oh, this, that, whatever, and it didn't work. So I learned from that and we did it again, but we shortened it. So it was, let's get the point across, let's do it. Enough time that it's fun and on a high note. Always, always end on a high note, know when to cut it off or else it can do more harm than good. So that was a lessons learned for me for sure. Phones obviously never need to be on deck, <clears throat> but phones are a part of our life. 20 years ago, if I walked in somewhere and someone was on their phone and put it down, I'd be like, oh, this is bad service here at Blockbuster or whatever. If you know Blockbuster, you're uh, you're old like me. So, um, but now if I walked into a store and someone put their phone down and served me, I probably wouldn't even think twice about it. I like to say how, instead of always having this battle with them, how do I find a way to like, respect them with making a good choice and not. So one of the things that I did at the facility, I was at um, brainstormed with my supervisor at the time and we we created a safe space in the guard office. So here's a big Muskoka Anirondack chair that you can sit in and we put a charging station beside it. So when you come, charge your phone on us. This is where it can go. You're welcome to sit in that chair to check out if your boyfriend or girlfriend's broken up with you or not, I don't know. Uh, but you should only ever be in that chair for a very short period of time and know when or when not to do it. And we created a safe space for that. And then we knew that there was no phones anywhere else. So we kind of like met in the middle. And I found with that approach, I didn't have issues with uh, phones in the guard office when I wasn't there because we had built a culture of, no, but this is where it can be. And we picked a spot that was out of sight from the public um, that worked. And that might not fit your leadership philosophy and that might not fit your organization and that's okay too. Um, but it's just to show you a way that you can look at a problem and say, how do I maybe do this a little differently versus just hitting them with a stick? Another thing I did is I printed a meme on funny labels and uh, instead of lecturing them, whenever I saw phones out, I just stuck this little label mean, um, meme to their phone. So when they went to pick it back up, there was the label and it was a joke, but it was me communicating to them. I saw your phone, it shouldn't be out. We laughed about it and um, that kind of helped with the behavior change there as well. Instead of you know running down that negative um, space and we laughed about it and we I really didn't have to use many of those stickers in that scenario. So I wanna show you a quick uh, video about cheering that I think um, encompasses how I feel about it. Oh, you're not just going to walk away and give up. Stop it. You can get that. That's yours. Nobody else. Get in there and give it some heat. Give it some heat. Get out of here. Get out of here. Get out of here. Get out of here. Don't go away. Get out of here. Get out of here. You can't. You can't. Yes. That's the one that's there. You can't. Yes. All right. Yes. So that's a Super Bowl commercial. And I love that because I think we need to cheer our team members on. If we wanna have a fun workplace and we wanna do these things, we have to cheer them on when they do a good job. And in that video, it's great because he's yelling and doing it and there's that awkward girl in the background and she's kind of like unsure, but then she gets into it, she's cheering with him. And we have to be that obnoxious guy to start the cheering because then our team's gonna join in and then get there and do it and they're gonna get into it. So cheering works, cheer your team members on and celebrate them. I wanna share some of the ones that um, have been memorable for uh, me in the past. Um, with how I've chosen to cheer with them really quickly. So uh, letters going home, this is great. So they don't, you don't get mail that much, especially if you're a kid these days. So what I like to do is uh, write a thank you card. My favorite color is orange. If you know me, you know that. So I like to have orange cards and I wrote a thank you letter. This one's to Anthony. And uh, I put it in a city envelope and I put confidential sticker on the back. So when mom and dad, check mail, they take it out, they see a letter from work with confidential on it and they're thinking their kid got fired or something. So then the kid comes home, they're like, get into the kitchen, open your mail, what'd you do, da 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 So it creates this like tense um, scenario at home sometimes. And then they like open it in front of their parents, they take it out and what is it? It's a thank you card from your boss saying, you freaking rock, thank you for being such an amazing team member. You know, here's what you did at work, we're so fortunate to have you. And then what do the parents do? Like, oh, I'm so proud of my kids. They start becoming your cheerleader at home. So you can't do that one all the time because then they catch on, but you can kind of go through cycles uh, when you go through and do that. So the link for that cheering one, I think if you just do cheer Super Bowl commercial, you'll find that one. 
So with Anthony, I want to share about the power of the small things as well. So this next um, slide is an audio, so I'm going to play it. You won't be able to see anything. You'll just hear the audio. Um, I'll set the scene for you. I am driving. <clears throat> um, let's go back. I get a text years later. This is um, a couple years ago. A team member says, hey, Caitlin, who baked the cakes I showed you earlier, is turning 25. A bunch of us are getting together for drinks at this place. It'd be great if you could see the old crew pop by for a drink. So I said, hey, it'd be cool to see everyone. This has been quite a few years, like five or six years later. So that day, I had put it in my calendar. I happened to be driving by that pub. I stop in for one drink to see the team, which was um, great to see everyone. And I'm sitting there, and this guy, Anthony, who I sent this card to, um, starts talking about his current job. And he says, you know, nothing was like when we worked at the pool. I loved it. It was great. I felt so good. You know, my current job, he was a mechanic, isn't so good. I don't get treated really well. You know, those were the glory days. He says, Joey, I still listen to the voicemail you sent me when I'm having really bad days. I have it saved on my phone, and it really makes me feel better sometimes. And I'm sitting there thinking, like, what the hell are you talking about? I have no idea what he's talking about. So let's fast forward. One day he had taught a course and uh, I got the feedback. It was his first time teaching a lifeguard course. He had just taken the certification. He actually had an Olympian in the course. So he was like really nervous about it. And I got the feedback and he did phenomenal. So on the way home, I pulled out my phone and I quickly called him and I just left him a voicemail. And here's the voicemail um, that I had left him. I'm just calling to say I love, sorry I didn't check in and say goodbye, I always do. Um, I'm just rushing out to meet a friend um, at the movie, so um, listen, I read your feedback, buddy, that was amazing, like I am beyond proud of you, buddy, like well done, well done, well done, can't say it again, well done. I totally scanned it and sent them to Anita, but anyway, I'll talk to you tomorrow, great work, buddy, I'm proud of you, bye. So this shows the power of those small things. And this shows the power of you being in the moment because here I am years later, some voicemail, I have no memory of guys. I had no memory of leaving this voicemail. Um, but it was a small thing I did that day that meant a big thing to him. And doesn't this guy pull out his phone in this pub and I'm like, cause I said like, Anthony, like, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm pretty sure you got me mixed up or something. And he plays me this voicemail in the pub years later. And it blew my mind. And of course I asked for it cause I wanted to share the story because I think that this really shows the power of those small things that you do when you really commit to celebrating your team members for the awesome people that they are or your coworkers. And you might think it's a small thing, a quick phone call on the way to the movies, but to them, it could be the world. So, so think of those things. Here's him now. And surely this is a pool relationship. So they ended up getting together. They um, have two children now. So, and, and I still love to see what's going on with his life on Facebook and touch base every now and then with him. So we're nearing the last couple slides here. And I really, I just want to leave you with, Simon does a really great job at so many things, Simon Sinek. And I think um, there was a lot of conversation about him on the pre-show. But we need to change our approach with future generations. And we have to stop fighting the future and we have to embrace it. So to the point of TikTok, we have to recognize this is how kids are connecting and communicating. We could be all like, oh, TikTok, we don't want to be into that. Or we can find a way to connect with them and help enrich our workplace and enrich their lives and our relationship um, with them through TikTok. So maybe it's a fun challenge where you're recognizing them on TikTok so that they can share it. Um, I don't know what it is. We need to figure that out. But we really, same thing with the cell phones and things. We have to look, guys. This is a new generation. We have to find ways to really embrace them and to find ways to motivate and recognize them. That's not just the stand up in front of everyone and cheer for them that worked 50 years ago. We have to be different. So remember that you're just one person. So no, you can't do all of this. And when I led multiple teams and multiple departments at multiple facilities, I couldn't do this for everyone. But what I could do was create a culture with my frontline full-time team with their frontline part-time team, where this was how we worked. We appreciated, we recognized, we had fun at work. We had fun at training. This was the culture that I tried to build and I tried to inspire them. That's what I did in full-time was try to inspire and build that culture. And you know what? They then went and got creative and they're smarter than us guys. These frontline team members, they have so many more years of creativity combined and passion and excitement. So just empower them to do that and, and have them suggest to you how you can have fun and be motivated in the workplace. So my call to action to you is to start seeing your problems as opportunities, guys, to get creative and to just do it. Use this time now while we're off on COVID 
use this time now to start planning your summer, plan your fun. How are we doing trainings? What are these things that we're doing? We can do that all now for the future. You can do it now for January next year. Plan your fun now to be set up for success later. So that's my challenge to you guys. I just want to put a quick little plug in here as well. Um, a COVID conversation. Uh, Justin's going to give us an hour of his time. He's a practicing ER doctor. He's the medical director for Stargard Elite. Um, he's one of the founders of Lifeguards Without Borders. So we're going to talk to him. So if you have questions, post them on the conversation in Lifeguard Authority or join the live and ask them. We're going to talk about, you know, what is COVID? What's the impact it's going to have on us? When we start going back to work, we're going to talk about the new resuscitation standards and what's going on there, um, how that might change how we work. So definitely you're going to want to check that out as well. So I'm going to turn this back to uh, Katie. And uh, I think we have some time for questions. We went just about an hour, so I'm glad we got there. Um, Katie, hopefully you were tracking the questions and you can pop some of them at me and I'll do my very best, guys, to answer them um, the best I can. Katie, are you there? I think she's there. Lifeguard Authority Show coming soon. We deferred the launch till September, but check it out. It's a podcast that's coming. Do I have to do something, Katie, to um, allow you to talk? No, it's just my low. One sec. Okay, sounds good. All right. Can everyone hear me? Can you let me know in the chat box? Because I that was a bit slow to come back. Just a quick yes. You can hear Katie. Perfect. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much, Joey. I know there was so much good information in that session. So I want to first start by addressing, I know there's a lot of stress in the chat box if you joined us late because you saw the post in Lifeguard Authority. Everything in the chat box, I will compile in the show notes. So the show notes are pinned in the chat box right now. You can see the show notes before they're re-updated. I will re-update all of the resources, all of the video links. If you go there now, you can see Joey's PowerPoint slides that he has kindly provided. The other thing that's come up in the chat box is people are wondering is the chat box, um, like the actual text of it, will it be linked? So I don't link the actual text to the chat box for privacy reasons, but I do pull out all of the sources and the comments. So what I'll do is I'll create lists on that show notes page of ideas. There were many different great ideas shared to build off of what Joey started. So don't stress, you will be able to see everything in the show notes. And should you so choose, if you go back to watch the recording when it's posted on YouTube tomorrow, you will also be able to live read the chat bar in the recording. So when I pull the recording, it's not just Joey's audio and visual, it is also the chat AV pod. So if you want to watch the chat in the live recording, you can do that. Okay, so bear with us. I know um, there was a lot of questions. I'm gonna address the questions first that I've collected from the beginning of Joey's presentation. As you guys have more questions, go ahead and pop those in the chat box, but I'm gonna start with the ones that came up already, let's say 20, minutes ago. Sorry, I just have to go through my papers here. Um, Joey, I also want to say, I, I said thank you. If I didn't, thank you. I particularly love that you shared. I think a lot of us don't recognize that when we started, we were young and dumb and we thought we knew everything. And I think it's such a critical lesson to circle back to when we're in management is to really recognize that we made mistakes. We may have hurt people. We may have made bad decisions and either correct those or at least acknowledge them moving forward. So I think that's yeah. awesome. I'll just add something. Kelly Martinez calls those her dark years. And I think it's really important that we celebrate our dark years with our team members because they have dark years and their life cycle and their career short. So I come back from conferences or watching one of your webinars even um, and I become smarter and have things that I was doing that were wrong. And then I have to say, here's what we're doing. But they're like, well, we just did that the training. And then you, you can name it. You can say, well, those are our dark years. We now know more, we can do that. And when you're able to do that as a leader, then they can do that and it cycles down through. And then you can change expectations and behaviors at a more rapid pace when you say, yeah, we were dumb then and now we're smarter, so let's do this. Yeah, and I think for me, I, like we were discussing a couple of weeks ago about your session and I had written aquatic staff and Joey emailed me and said, you need to change the session to team. And I'm kind of like, well, what's the big deal? But now I have that perspective and it's something I know for me, I switched from customer to client probably three years ago. 
And that for me is a no brainer now. So it's just adjusting my mentality as well of team now that I've heard your perspective, because I, I do agree it's more of a collective embracing than us versus them, right? Like it is more all inclusive. Yeah. Um, first question we had quite a while ago was from us, uh, and forgive me if I don't have the name of the person, but somebody asked, how can you uh, make your staff feel welcome if you don't have a dedicated pool guard room or space for them? A space for them. So I think um, you can create other types of spaces. So maybe you're creating a digital space for them. So when you hire them, maybe you have a Facebook group or some type of thing like that where you can still post. So when I onboard new team members, I do a video every time that I send with the instructions on how to onboard them. So if you don't have a physical space, you can do something like that, but we still have the deck. So maybe you're creating on the, the wall of your bathhouse or a change room a space where you're celebrating your teams and you're still posting some information. Um, I had that challenge as well with a lot of my camp teams where uh, they didn't have anywhere to go on their break. So sometimes I had to just like buy like a, a tent and put a couple pots and a picnic table um, that I connected with parks and create a space um, for them as well that we can update. And then you're getting creative with how you're sharing that. So I think if you brainstorm enough, you can carve out your own space for your team. It just might look different depending on um, where, where you are. And sometimes you might just take over one change room stall in a change room. So they have that change room space that they can call their own and do that. So I think every building is going to have that challenge and have to brainstorm that uniquely on their own. Yeah, I love that idea, that digital space. And I would encourage anyone who's still on this chat, if you have any ideas that have worked for you, please pop those in the chat box or the Facebook group, a private Instagram page, maybe use a scheduling software meeting, like a messaging board, group me texting, YouTube. So do you do a video recording on YouTube and it's an unlisted video that you send to them? Yeah. Or even these softwares like Digiquatics and things like that, you can you know use that. And I'm sure that they've got touch points um, with that as well. So just, just get creative and figure out what your barriers are and how do we work around that. Perfect. Another question that came up a while ago was when you were talking about the different challenges, are they exclusively for staff or are customers at all engaged in those challenges? So we, yeah, we do we do one with the, with the team specifically and uh, it expanded to not just our aquatics team. It kind of grew into trying to encourage partnerships with the front desk or camps or you know different partners. Um, I've never done one. Uh, that's a great idea, actually, to get one where they're pairing up with the guests that are coming to the facility. Definitely do lots of um, challenges with your guests. So swim across the U.S. or Canada or whatever, you know, they track. There's tons of initiatives you can do there that I often see our team um, join. But I like that idea of doing a finished challenge where some of the regulars. And if you work in an outdoor community pool, you've got kids and youth that are coming every day of the summer. Right. So maybe you engage them as part of that as well, because they're your future team members anyway. Right. So that's a great idea. Another question that came up from Kelly a little while ago was how do you like practically operationally speaking, let's say we're back in our pools in six months, balance <laughs> these challenges with like your regular duty operations? Is it once every couple months you do a challenge? Is it monthly? Like how do you figure your workload for that? So I think when you do the math, so an average guard works, let's say six hours a day, they're on the stand for, you know, four to six of those hours, and then they have these off rotations. So if you have a burpee challenge, and all of these challenges are meant to be done in like three to five minutes. So there's no reason why you can't have them. So I would do the same challenge for a two week chunk of time, um, or a one week chunk of time at the most. And really, you're asking them for potentially three times five minutes, 15 minutes out of a week when they're working 40 hours. So I don't think that it's really impeding um, on that work when my big thing is that everything has to be done as soon as our pools open in the summer. So all the planning has to be done. So I'm not doing this when I'm, you know, needing to be on deck, leading my teams and doing that. It's all planned out ahead of time. But I think with good planning and organization, it doesn't really impede on it. But for sure, you if you do it too much too often, then it loses its luster, right? So that's why I always say one week of popcorn week, that's it in the year. Um, because if you do it every session or every quarter, then it, it, it doesn't become a special fun thing to look forward to. Uh, but 
I definitely to say, hey, we're going to do a potluck every other Friday where people bring things in with a theme. You could do that throughout the year because we know food's good, but your coordinated one, I would say to, to just be mindful of the frequency. So there is some truth to, to balancing that. I think also to go off Joey's point, if I think the question too for Kelly was also from like a manager's workload perspective. I love Joey, your point that maybe you lead the first one and then you let the staff pick it up and they continue it without you or not without you, but like it's staff led. So I know we had a very popular potluck 15 years ago at a facility I worked at and it was staff driven. And we just sort of drew names and every three weeks or every second week on Friday, cause it was a long shift, we would do a potluck. So I would encourage you guys to think, we had a long discussion about food and we'll circle back to that in a little bit, but definitely it can be staff led and you will have some passionate bakers. Like you said, Joey, that person who loves to cook, who loves to bake, who loves to, tinker that if you would cre pre sorry, create an encouraging environment that adds benefit and value to the workplace and it doesn't cost anything other than saying like oh you know we're maybe joey's going to vote on the best chili this week or another manager is going to bring their special traditional dish right you can do a lot with that without actually um we did a chili challenge at my workplace a few years ago and i just bought some little um, daisy drinking cups and some little mini spoons it cost 10 bucks and then we sampled and voted on each other's chili right there's ways you can yeah. do that and 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 for sure uh, any initiative you do think how does this work three years from now and if it's you doing it all of the time i don't want you to think that i'm spending hundreds and hundreds of dollars you invest in the beginning to get the ball rolling and then it takes a life of its own so and the last thing is you do also need to be mindful of some of these food allergies and considerations to be inclusive so sometimes i'm putting in a little extra effort to make sure there's an accommodation um, for someone that like i'm lactose intolerant so i have a brick of lactose free cheese in the fridge so some of that stuff tends to cost a little bit more if you have to make those um, slight adjustments but yeah um, I also want to circle back, Joey, there was a question, uh, or sorry, I loved your point about don't just record the winner, or reward, excuse me, the winner of your competition. I think as a society in general, we sometimes we put too much emphasis on, rec on um, rewarding the highest performer and then greasing the person who needs a lot of help or who's struggling. And then those people in the middle who are average dependable performers, they get lost in the mix. So could you talk a little bit about like any of your philosophy on that or how you make sure that you hit those that middle range or everyone? Yeah, and you really want to build a team, right? What we want is we want that like fun guy that's super fit to really be the cheerleader to get other people trying it and then them getting challenged. So maybe someone's on their back, you know, while they do it with other people. So you see that happening, that 150 challenge that we did um, this guy that he's like, oh, I can do five minutes with a brick. And I was like, BS, there's no way. And I didn't know he was a national water polo player at the time. So I was like, I'll buy you, you know, whatever you want at Subway for lunch if you do. And he just did 15 minutes. And then I said, well, could you do 30? And we Facebook lived it. So really find those people to kind of find a way to celebrate them and make them feel good because that person's invested a lot of themselves into being fit, no different than you're going to celebrate someone else for something. So find a way to do that. But as a whole culture, you want to celebrate engagement. Same thing with fitness at trainings. Stop making it about individual performance all the time. Say 10 people at the station, the pace time for this is this times 10 people. We want everyone to accomplish as a team this many lengths in this period of time. And you know the byproduct of that is everyone working to do this result. But try to look at these team things so that people are working with each other. And the best thing about these summer fit challenges, it, be, it builds these behaviors. And then throughout the year, they're all going to the gym and working with each other. And it's building kind of these new social clusters on your team that you wouldn't have expected previously. Yeah. No, I think in general, I noticed there were some comments in the chat that maybe they hadn't, um, participants hadn't thought about recognizing personal achievements. So I love that you brought that up, Joey, that maybe we have a average i mean in the best way possible a dependable employee whose lessons are average they're not you know the greatest but they've done really well in school or they've gotten into a university or they're getting married or you know i think those personal achievements are so often missed and we see and we're not seeing our staff as people so can you give us some other ideas of achievements you've recognized in your staff just to get people thinking about how they can either find out that information or get their staff to know their staff better yeah, I think a big part of that culture is, so one, you have to know your team to do any of this. If you're not spending time talking to your team to get to know them, you can't celebrate crap with them. 
And I always tell my um, frontline supervisors, if you can't fly around a crap on people, the seagull approach to leadership. If you're going to go correct to behavior and it's a negative message, and that's going to be your first interaction with that team member, shut your mouth and oh. observe them more to celebrate them before you start working, because you have to build that rapport um, with mm -hmm. them. And that maybe I haven't been working with them enough to, to really um, do that. And it builds this, like, I have to know my team to lead my team culture. So. Um, and that's why I like the celebration. So we're we're celebrating. I got honors. We're celebrating. I got my driver's license. You know, we're celebrating a wide range of these things that might not have to do with work. But then the work things start coming up, right? I took this certification. I now teach this class, and then it it gets them doing um, more of those things. Um, but you, then you have these other things. I had a team member who was really into computer programming and came up with this idea of how we could do subs, and he like made this computer app thing to do it we couldn't use it because of other things but you know again that was a huge celebration because that was a skill set that is different that he wanted to contribute to make us better to do it so they're all going to have different ways of doing that i think the big celebration is you being in tune to what they are another one is like know how there's the the love languages that exist in relationships touch words of affirmation, time, all those things, know what their appreciation language is as well. And if they love getting you know, celebrated, then find your facility manager or director and ask when they're in the facility next, could they pop by the pool and celebrate this team member for this? And it's just an appointment in a calendar and a brief email. And that's gonna work really well for them. But you do that on the wrong person and it's like, they're gonna be mortified. So I think a big part to answer your question is you have to know them and then just be creative with finding ways to recognize them um, that way. And I want to just- They can do, they, they might not be athletic, but they're doing the quotes and they're decorating the board or when you're choosing paint colors, if they're into makeup and designing and stuff, those are the ones that I bring a color swap thing and I say, can you work with the team to figure out what color we want to paint things? I don't need to decide, you use your skills and then we can celebrate, didn't so-and-so come up with a great color for us to do? Yeah, I think that's so key, Joey. I love what you said. So one of the things I reshared in the chat box, I mentioned this a few webinars ago, but I still think there's a ton of value. Let's say you don't know your team right now. And I love, Joey, what you said. There's a lot of uh, agreement in the chat box, right? Don't, if you're just going to be correct a behavior, but without knowing the person, you should get to know the person first. And so if you don't have the benefit, Yes, 100%. But let's say you've had a staff member, like let's say you're starting today, April 13th, and you say, you know what, I have 40 staff. I hardly know any of them. I'm turning a new leaf. I want to get to know them. Uh, Joey mentioned the five love languages. I'm popping that in the chat box when my broadband picks up. I've also popped in 16 personalities. That is a free quiz that you can get your staff to complete. And then you will know, are they, yes, are they the extrovert, outgoing, they love accolades, they want to be publicly recognized? Or are they somebody like me who's like, don't want to be the center of attention, don't want to be publicly recognized, just, you know, let it go? So I think definitely that's an option. You could do that as a, a staff quiz right now. You could just send it out and it's voluntary, right? If people complete it, then you get to know them a little bit more personally um, or quizzes. There was a, a question a while ago, Joey, about what platform are you using with your employer to meet with your staff? I believe you said WebEx and you're doing different activities through web meetings. Is that correct currently? Yeah, just a quick disclaimer. We're gonna use four of the love languages because we're not gonna be using touch in the workplace. So let's just be very clear with everyone yeah. on that. Um, yeah. <laughs> so uh, I, our, our, the organization I work for uses um, WebEx. I personally use Zoom with Lifeguard Authority. We, you can have free Google Hangouts and different, there's tons of free platforms. I just downloaded one with my friends. It's like Home Hangout or something. So if you don't have one of those, you can easily do a free version. Um, of that you can do zoom you just can only do a certain length of time so there's tens of free options that you can make any of these things happen with your team another question that came up joey what would you do if you're working in a situation where it's a one guard facility so your team is very much not together yeah. maybe one comes in for a morning another card comes in at night how do you what are your what's your experience yeah so this is very familiar to like a ymca environment or a boys and girls club some of these like uh, athletic clubs or a rural community um, where their budgets um, are, are quite strange. So 100% this becomes a challenge. So again, you're really gonna have to lean on some of those digital things. So what I would encourage is 
you know, invest a few hundred dollars in a tablet or a um, an iPad so that at the beginning of their shift, if they don't have a phone, they can scan maybe a barcode and you have a weekly message to everyone. So you might not be able to be there at six o'clock. I'm not a morning person in the morning, but you can have them scan and you're like, hey everyone, welcome to this week. So you can try some of those connections and celebrate individual team members through some of that. You do have your trainings where you can pull people together as well. Um, and, and the other thing is uh, build these things. Like I, I like to try to say, if you can get your team going out for appetizers or um, you just plan, hey, we're all gonna go to the trampoline park this day or go-karting or laser tag. Like when we that one photo, we all went to a laser tag place and we dressed up as superheroes. I was a super gangster. So sometimes if they all work individually, you can try to like plan some of these random things. Yeah, they have to pay their own way to go, but sometimes they choose to just come together and do that anyway. So it definitely is an uphill battle. It's way harder to do. Um, but I think if with technology, it makes it easier for us to, you know, connect with people a little bit closer. Yeah, there was a lot of questions in the chat box. We won't go through them in detail right now, but there was a lot of questions in the chat box. Generally, people are saying, you know, my facility won't pay for food or my facility won't give me the locker revenue from coin lockers or they won't give me the deposit recycling from bottles. How do I do these things? And so I really, um, I know that's a tough place and you may not have the budget personally and professionally to, to spend any money. So I just really wanna encourage everyone to think critically and creatively. Joey touched on this, but I think it's also worth, worth plugging Natalie and Ashley from Aquatics Tribe, their crisis connection on Friday or on Thursday last week. I'm just going to plug the link in the chat. It's an entirely free resource. On Thursday, April 9th, so session number three, they talked exactly about this. So think creatively without any no's. Just think, what do I want to do? Don't think I can't do it. I mean, I know it's realistic. You don't have the money, but if you start thinking creatively, there was a lot of things in the chat box that I'll reshare on the show notes, but things um, that I know that have worked for me have also been, if you've got that regular client or customer who comes in and they want to do something nice at the end of the year or for staff or for their birthday, you know, like that retiree that's got some extra money, ask for grocery gift cards or ask for sponsorship or donations. I've had vending machine, uh, uh, sort of, Least you can get a candy, a candy gumball machine and just yeah. candy in the guard office. They'll burn through that. So it, I, I just want to echo what you're saying. So for me, I personally am okay putting a little bit of money in. I'm single. I have no family. And I understand my situation's a little different. If I want to, like a teacher, my friends are teachers. They pay to do their class. So yeah, sometimes I have a candy jar, do that and, and do that. But that's not the reality for everyone. And I'm not saying you have to do that, but then maybe you just get creative and you say, great, we're gonna do custom t-shirts and we're gonna mark it up by $5 a t-shirt as a fundraiser with our team to buy a popcorn maker and to do this. So yeah, you might just yeah. have to put a little bit more work in if you don't have access to the resources, but to just say, well, they don't give us money, wham, 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 and then just use that as an excuse to not do it. You know, I'm, yeah. if you asked all your friends, I'm sure you can find yourself an old blender. And, and get one that way as well. Dollar stores, there's, there's tons of options there. So I'm more of a find the way to say yes instead of reflect on the no kind of guy. Um, and and if, if you can't get over that thing, then just do the no cost options within your workplace as well. Yeah, the last thing I'll say about food, I was very lucky. I volunteered at a food bank for several years. So we would batch cook for 200, 300 people every Tuesday night. And so I, myself as a cook, am very accustomed to having $150 to feed 300 people and just figuring it out. So I would just encourage you, there were some good comments in the chat box about crock pots, Instapots. I mean, there's nothing, spaghetti sauce and spaghetti costs 20 bucks to feed 40 people, but you just need the time to boil the spaghetti and, and heat the sauce, right? So often I think, yeah, I had, a super, I had a supervisor to your point about cooking. Um, his name was Jay Hahn back when, and he cooked us a Christmas dinner. We all paid $35 a ticket and he yeah. was in the kitchen. We all came and he cooked us vegetables and meat and something. He rented a place with the money. This thing meant more to us than anything else. And the food was great. He cooked it. It was like a, a thing of love. And that was his way of really um, recognizing us, right? So if that's a skill set, like you're saying, that you can cook for a lot of people and do that, then maybe that's your way of appreciating them. So I think that's a great example, Katie. 
Well, and I think to your point, Joey, finding what you're passionate about, whether you're a quilter, a scrapbooker, whatever that is, you can give your staff that. Let's say you're not passionate about cooking, like you're good at video and, and like social media, Joey. So you're doing a personal campaign that's easier for you because it's within your wheelhouse, but it's also that much more appreciated by your staff because it's that much better. Right. So I don't think there's a one size fits all for everybody who's still on this chat. What is your personal passion? How can you do that for your staff? And if they know that that's your what you love to do, they're going to be extra touched that you took the time to do it. And it's reflective of you. Right. Like it's not all the same for everyone. Yeah. Um, there was a question. I don't know if this still matters, but somebody was asking, Joey, what you meant by DS team. Is that a specific term? Does it matter? Oh, so um, yeah, in in a lot of the greater Toronto area, we call our um, frontline supervisors, deck supervisors, DS. That's a good lingo catch. Thank you. Um, it, a lot of pools, I find them being called assistant managers and pool managers or person in charge, that frontline part-time supervision layer, um, the big eye, if you were to talk to Jim Wheeler, uh, that, that layer of protection, yeah. A couple other things I just want to briefly mention. If you've got more questions, please pop them in the chat box. We're going to start wrapping up. I've got most of the questions I can see. Uh, I love also, Joey, you mentioned about craft paper. So you can get a roll of 100 meters of craft paper, typically in Canada, for let's say $80 from a school store. We used to use that all the time. Like once a week, we would actually change it either on the table in the staff room or on the wall. And it could just be kind of like a greeting each other. What's the theme of the week? Like you said, quotes, sharing stories, achievements. And it's just paper. We would recycle it. So if you, a whiteboard is obviously better. But we did find that the craft paper, if there was something really nice, we could cut it out and either frame it in a $5 frame from Ikea, right? Or we could save it, laminate it. That's the one option I like about the heavy duty craft paper. Um, yeah, so I'll, I just want to add a point there. Two things. One, Jessica just wrote about breakfast. Um, your, finish your thought on there. I'm not a morning person. Everyone knows that. I go to work like 10, 11 o'clock. If I show up at six o'clock in the morning to cook breakfast for people, it's like, boom, like the world's ending. This is the greatest thing ever because I woke up. So look for those stereotypes within your um, work-life balance as well. Um, but another thing is with these things in the craft paper, the chalkboard wall, the food things, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when someone's going to do something dumb, okay? Someone's going to write something inappropriate on it, okay? Someone's going to break your popcorn maker. Someone's going to do something. So don't go into this and when it happens, say, we're done. Go into it with your eyes wide open. Someone's going to break. I'm going to have to replace it. Someone's going to write something dumb. I'm going to have to address it with them, take it down, do some damage control, and we're going to have to, as a team, learn from that about respectful workplace and grow, right? So these things are still going to have disruptions, and they're going to still have things that uh, might be some lessons learned, but go into it knowing okay, when this happens, how are we going to deal with it? And put those checks and balances in place so everyone's kind of very aware of that. And I find that when you really invest in positive culture, um, and that's actually a priority of yours, you don't really get those. I usually get those types of things when I'm new into a team. So what I do is I don't do those types of initiatives till I know that the culture, I can trust it, that I can put these types of open forms up that someone's not going to draw a penis on the wall or something stupid like that, right? So know, know when to do things as well. Yeah, I think that's that's huge because I have worked for managers that claw it back if they think that it's been abused and one person ruins the fun for everyone. And I think I love your your sense of being prepared for that and anticipating it and also leading up to it. So when I started food at my last facility, I actually took an idea. I don't know if Westside Recreation in Calgary is still on this call, but I learned this at Westside Recreation about eight years ago. When they have their um, condensed swim lessons after Christmas between New Year's, like your five-day swim lessons where it's a whirlwind and everybody's super, super under the gun to do their report card, on the fourth day, Thursday, they would not let you leave until you've done your report cards in the guard room and so they would provide lunch or they would do a potluck lunch and every week a different supervisor would bring the lunch. So that was actually addressing a pain point in a different area of the facility, which was poor quality report cards during crunch swim lessons. And then from that, it can become more of a team building thing, but it addresses a pain point first, instead of perhaps rolling back something that you did to be nice, that's not fully understood why you did it, 
right, can also be a way to get it approved with your manager if they're saying, well, why are we paying, you know, $60 for lunch? Well, we it's going to save me $60 in overtime dealing with Mrs. Smith, who's unhappy with the report card she got for her three kids that had nothing written in it, right? And one, one thing I want to add too that was mentioned in the chat box, but I'll restate, if you work for an organization that provides coffee to the facility operators, the maintenance staff, the janitorial staff, anything like that, I think you need to have a tough conversation about food because you can't say, well, we're going to give coffee to 400 administrative staff five days a week with three flavors of creamer and two different types of coffee and that you can't give us $40 every couple months for pizza. I mean, it's literally the same thing. And I've worked for rate payer municipal organizations. Yes, we have accountability, but they're they're giving barbecues to the firefighters. They're giving pizza to the firefighters. I'm not saying that we're firefighters, but there is a continuum that we can have that conversation and say, look, can you give me $200 this year? And I will cook from scratch to save money. Then maybe next year it's $300 and we can afford to start to do a little bit more. Yeah, two quick things on that. One, I think that it's not intentional. <clears throat> I think that when your whole world in an HR department revolves around interacting about full time, <clears throat> that's what you do. So one of the strategies you have to do is people don't know what they don't know and you have to educate them. So if you have an internal intranet and you can celebrate these cool things that you're doing on that and educate people that we exist, here are some cool things that we do, you can start changing the culture. The other thing that I'm just going to put out there as a reality, so we're not going into this like kumbaya completely, is one of the big challenges is once you start having success in your team, everyone else doesn't want to put the work in, but they want to have that same re reward. So they say, well, why does that person get to do all of those things? Why does that team get this? Why does that team get that? And that's going to be a real struggle that a lot of people that are doing these things that I've struggled with in organizations that I've worked for. And you have to not just like get into conflict. You have to say, okay, well, why don't you invite your team and I'll show you how I did this? Or why don't I give you my resources so that you can show them? Because they look at it and they think that the organization is paying for all of these things. But then when you invite them in and you educate them more, and then they realize that like, wow, your whole team's donating you know, berries for Waffle Week and they're bringing in juices and stuff. And you're like, yeah, this is like how we are as a team and what we want to do. I find that the, those naysayers back up pretty quick because then they realize, wow, I haven't really bred an appropriate culture with my team potentially. So also know that that is, I think, going to be a point of friction that you're probably going to face um, and just be prepared for that and go into it non-confrontational and very here, let me help you get this started yourself um, and help a rising tide lists all boats as well. Yeah, I think that's that's so true. I know I've experienced that. I'm sure other people in the chat have experienced that. I got pulled into my manager's office once. He was new and he said, I heard from another department that you bought ice cream sundaes for all of your staff. And I said, no, I bought ice cream in on sale from the grocery store. I bought one char jar of chocolate sauce, one jar of cherries, some cookies. I can bring you the receipt. It was $23 and I fed 35 staff members with glass bowls in the kitchen. And he was like, oh, well, there's photos. I said, yeah, there's photos because people had fun with chocolate sauce and cherries, but it cost $22 to feed 33 people. It was a dollar a person. Do you have a problem with that? No, but can you bring me the receipt? Because I want to take it back up with that manager as to why they were basically throwing shade about your ice cream sundaes because they heard about it in the ops department. And it's like, you know what? People are going to do that, right? They're jealous or they don't understand that hard work. There's good, there's fast, there's cheap, as you know right? I, and, I can do it cheap. It's going to take some time, but the end result is still worthwhile. Yeah, and learn your organization, right? So if those things are happening. You have a manager that's doing that. Then, you know, I need to just be proactive. I have to plan this in COVID so that I can say, here's what I want to do. My budget is $1 per person. Can we stomach that or not? No. So that, you know, you need to be, you, you, you have to also, I think, um, one of the things I learned is you have to you have to become good at managing up as well. You have to learn the culture and the environment and the world that you're working in. Um, and I've been fortunate to work for some really great organizations, but I through my consulting, I work with people where they have some of those barriers. And it's like, okay, well, let's figure it out instead of just like throwing our arms up and not doing anything. 
Yeah, I think that's maybe a good place to end unless there's any final questions. I think very much, I love your point, Joey, managing up. So those of you, if you're not familiar with the term, that's very much how can I take responsibility and push the message up to my superiors in a way that's going to be favorable to the outcome that I would like or that we need. We'll be having a session at the end of April. Jason Simituk, he's a recreation um, consultant that I know for many years now, but he's going to be talking about how to, as aquatic people, really promote what we want or we need in our department when it's competing against other departments. So that's the session. If you're facing those challenges, definitely to consider registering for when I get that link up. I also really want to leave everybody with a, a really, I want you to take action. Joey's talked a lot about something, but don't do nothing. And so I don't want you to leave this session thinking, oh my goodness, he's got all these great ideas. I've been doing not a great job where do I start so Joey if you had some final words where could people start like during COVID with the stress that they're facing where do you start if not me then who if not now then when okay start small know you're gonna fail um, you know that you're not gonna be great at it when you start when I first started I sucked a lot of things weren't so great you're gonna get better over time just like anything it's a muscle you got to work it out to get it stronger um, just start small have big wins you know listen to your team ask them you know, what their thoughts are, you know, they're smart, you know, spend time asking before you find out later. That's not something I did when I first started. Um, yeah, just start small and, and, and start, right? If not me, then who? If not now, then when? Make it happen. Yeah. Okay. Well, I want to say a big thank you to Joey Rusnak from Lifeguard Authority. Please join the Facebook group. Um, I'm going to answer your question in a second, Marjan. The Facebook group, Lifeguard Authority, it is in the chat. It is on the show notes. The show notes are pinned on the page. You will also notice in the show notes the same plug as Joey mentioned, the Facebook Live on Friday for Dr. Justin Sempsot. We will be bumping Kelly Martinez's foam and vomit, making in-service more realistic. Her session will be bumping later 90 minutes so we'll be starting around this time instead of at our normal time slot so make sure you join lifeguard authority or register for kelly's session people are asking for your frogs joey so i'll get a link from you later if you can find those frogs again on google <laughs> they were very very popular um uh, thank you to Joey. He was also, as I mentioned at the beginning of the show, he was recently in the Aquatics International Magazine Power 10 issue. So I've linked to that in the chat box. I'm also going to link briefly those of you who are still here on Wednesday this week. So two days from now, we're going to have Ben Zimmerman here from ABC First Aid and Aquatics. Really exciting session. I'm excited to attend talking about how can you start your side gig. Right, so Joey started Lifeguard Authority. I started Lakeview Aquatic Consultants. Many of you in the room right now, you have an idea. If now, then when, right? Now is the time. I heard a really great podcast a few weeks ago that talked about Zumba. Zumba, the fitness um, trend, exploded after the 20, uh, 2008 financial crisis. The Zumba founders, they credit the financial crisis with Zumba taking off because everybody needed a side hustle. Everybody needed a second job, a third job. Find your passion and find a way that you can do something with it. And I think if you come to Wednesday's session with Ben, he's going to talk a lot about um, starting, what that looks like. Just think about what, what ideas do you have, and maybe that'll give you some good ideas. I'm going to post the link in the chat box. Sorry, my, my internet is a bit slow today. I'll also put a link to Kelly in the chat box. Uh, she will be on Friday and then next Monday we have swim angelfish. So if you're not aware, we do have swim angelfish coming to talk about their adapted swim programs, the swim whisper programs. So if you're not familiar with their programs, please consider registering. They also have great free webinars online. So I think that's it for today. I'm going to pop those links in the chat box. Those of you who want to hang out, I will, my internet's just a bit slow. I think we'll say thank you to Joey. Let him go on his way. Thank you for giving us an hour and a half of your time, almost two hours. You can connect with him through Lifeguard Authority. You can put other comments or questions to him. He posted earlier this morning, and that way everybody will be able to see the, the answers. The webinar recording for this session will be up later tomorrow, Tuesday, so you can subscribe to us on YouTube or look at the show notes. All right, I think that's it, guys. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, Monday, April 13th, thanks for spending almost two hours with us. I look forward to seeing you on Wednesday if you're here 
or Friday or in the Facebook Live with Justin, Dr. Justin Semprasat next week. Or Friday, excuse me. I've reached the point where I need to take a break from talking. Thank you so much, guys. Have a great rest of your day. Be nice to yourself. Stay safe.